Good morning. It's 8 o'clock, so we'd like to get going. Uh, welcome back. For those of you who were here yesterday, welcome to all of the new attendees today. I'm Linda Whitney. I'm the Executive Director of the Medical Board of California. Thank you for attending. A few little housekeeping items before we get going today. Please silence your cell phones and mobile devices. If you're planning to obtain CME credit, you will need to complete the form in your packet and turn it in at the end of the day. And you should have signed up at the registration tables. We'll be emailing the certificates to the email address on the form in about 30 days. So we must have a completed form by the end of the day for you to receive credit. Please write legibly as we can't send a certificate to someone that's email address we can't read. Um, if you're not seeking CME credit, we'd still like you to complete an evaluation form so we know um, how you felt about this experience and what information we can work on to provide uh, for future forms if um, they come to pass. Um, we have scheduled breaks between the speakers as noted on the agenda and um, there are snacks and um, drinks in the uh, atrium so you can purchase those. Um, Please remain in your same seats after breaks and lunches. It would be easier to keep track of all of you for CME purposes. Uh, due to the tight schedule, uh, we don't have conference staff coming in and bussing the table, so please uh, take your trash and, and toss it as you uh, leave. We have time for questions today after some of the presentations and panels. And instead of cards like we used yesterday, we have microphones in the um, aisle way and we will be using those. Please keep your questions to questions so all of the participants who want to ask questions will have uh, an opportunity to do so. We're going to break at noon for lunch. We only have an hour. Uh, the conference center has arranged for some uh, quick sandwiches, salads, I encourage you to stay close, but there are restaurants around. Uh, Starbucks is a half mile. IHOP is across the street. Houlihan's is next door. There's a Chinese buffet on the other side, and there's other fast food in the neighborhood. But again, I encourage you to stay close by. We have a full agenda today. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, a former board member of the Medical Board of California and vice president. Dr. Cesar Aristiguita is a board certified emergency physician and director of EMS and disaster preparedness for emergent medical associates in Manhattan Beach, California. He also serves as associate director of the emergency department at Centinella Hospital and Medical Center in Inglewood, as well as co-director of the urgent care centers at Martin Luther King Multidiscipline Care Center and the Hubert H. Humphrey Comprehensive Health Care Center in Los Angeles. Mr. Reese DeGita previously served as the director of the California Emergency Medical Services Authority and as, um, as I mentioned, vice president of the medical board. Dr. Caesar, as his patients and most of us call him, has a unique background. He was born in Venezuela, now is a physician, but he's been an EMT, a policeman, a volunteer ski patroller, disaster relief worker, White House fellow, and director of California's Emergency Medical Services Authority. Please welcome Dr. Caesar. There we go. All right. Everybody hear me okay? I have to say at 51, I've become dependent on the glasses. I see many with gray hair and glasses too, so I feel well at home. Um, it just, I wasn't here yesterday. Um, I had some uh, clinical responsibilities, so I'm curious uh, who's in the audience. So let me do a show of hands. Uh, physicians and uh, allied health professionals, uh, physician extenders, raise your hand. That's a great number. How about uh, regulators, uh, say uh, staff or execs uh, of uh, medical boards, uh, pharmacy boards and the like? Okay, a handful of those. 
and of course they're in the back. Uh, they, they always have our back. Um, and uh, uh, anybody else, uh, media? Um, I don't see media. How about lawmakers or their staffs? All right, and pharmacists, I'm sorry, very, very good point. Yeah, a great number, thank you very much for coming. All right, so as you saw my uh, presentation, it's titled The uh, Physician's Perspective, and I'm, I'm a working emergency physician. I do have administrative responsibilities, but my goal today is to talk to you about what it's like on the front line of uh, the, the pre prescription abuse uh, epidemic that, frankly, we're facing uh, across our state and, frankly, across our nation at this time. Um, as Linda said, uh, by way of personal background, I'm a practicing uh, board-certified emergency physician. I have a special interest in substance abuse and dependence, uh, both including the early recognition of the treatment as such. I've written scholarly articles on it. I uh, participated in, in uh, training. I used to work uh, uh, training medical students at the Betty Ford Center on uh, quick interventions and substance abuse treatment and how to put it in perspective of their, pract their future practices. Um, as Linda said, I was a member of the medical board. I was the president of the Division of Medical Quality when we had two divisions. That's the division that oversaw all the um, uh, physician uh, investigations and discipline uh, for physicians that had violated the Medical Practice Act. Uh, oh, not quite there yet. And uh, I was vice president of the board once we reorganized the board. And I was a member of the pain management task force. And we'll talk a little bit about the task force later. Uh, about 10 years ago, we convened a uh, pain management task force to address the issues of um, what we believed at the time was the undertreatment of pain. Um, and I think that that's probably the root of a lot of today's problems was the heavy emphasis on the, the uh, at the time what we believed was the undertreatment of pain. Uh, finally, I want to tell you that I was a former police officer. I was a street cop. Uh, wearing a uniform, shagging calls. Uh, I worked the night shift while I put myself through college. So I, I worked night, night shift for five years. Uh, I was a police officer for seven and full time and a couple years as a reserve. So uh, that certainly gave me a perspective about the criminal aspect of drug and alcohol abuse. I was a court recognized expert. But when I became a physician, I realized that something had to change and that informed a lot of my experience and my decision making. So a lot of the pictures you'll see are my own. Uh, I'm a nature and wildlife photography when a photographer when I'm not doing all the other things that you see. And my mom says that I'm not happy unless I'm going 100 miles an hour on fire. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, the way that we feel as providers in front of the patients when they come into the emergency department with a chronic pain syndrome asking for another refill of their chronic pain medication. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about why those feelings are, are uh, not so endearing. Um, like any uh, medical presentation, I want to start out with a case. So I want to tell you one of literally hundreds of cases. And if I go around the room, I bet you guys have some great stories too. So how many of you know what um, familial Mediterranean, Mediterranean fever is? I see two, three, four hands. Oh, pretty good. Uh, so, just out of the audience, what, what is the main sin, symptom of familial Mediterranean fever? Abdominal pain, yes. So guess what, I got an abdominal pain patient coming to the ER, and are there any tests to find out if somebody has it? Not acutely, there are no tests. The only test is a genetic test to see if you have a, the, the genetic ver, uh, mutation that causes basically peritonitis. So this is a setup uh, immediately when I, when I hear this story. Of course, this patient arrives by 911. It's very dramatic. He's rolling around on the gurney. You know, there, there's no pain scale that's going to rate his pain. But he's also diaphoretic. He's got a bag of vomit next to him. Uh, I mean, the, the, the visual is very convincing. Um, the, uh, the patient, of course, requests Dilaudid by name. And at 28, he had already developed allergies to morphine, Toradol, acetaminophen, anything else that I wanted to give him other than the, the Um Of course, when I went to examine him, he's in a fetal position. He doesn't want to roll over. He says he needs pain medication before he can lay flat for my exam. I'm pretty generous. I give, him, I give everybody one benefit of the doubt. And so I give him two milligrams of Dilaudid, IV fluids, anti-emetics, meaning so he won't vomit anymore for the non-clinical types. 
And I ordered some labs, and you know, his belly seems like it's tender, so I want to make sure he doesn't have appendicitis or some other crazy thing that may actually be causing him pain. Uh, the patient's mother is at the bedside, and she is coming to me about every five minutes telling me how much pain her son is in and how much he needs uh, additional uh, doses of pain medications. And each time lab or x-ray show up to do their work, uh, he uh, just refuses to go with the program, and he says that he's in too much pain and he needs more pain medication. So how many of you think some of these things are red flags? Uh, can I see some hands? Yeah, the laughter kind of tells me, yes, you felt the same way I did, uh, which is, you know, something doesn't add up. Something's not kosher in Peoria right now. And so, um, I, you know, it's time to start investigating. And he tells me that he's got a, you know, a GI doctor at UCLA, and he gives me a name and a phone number. Of course, I try to call it, and there's no answer. Uh, and this is actually in the middle of the day. It's not even nighttime or weekend. Um, you know, there's a voicemail, and I leave a voicemail, but there's no callback. Um, you know, and I'm, and I'm trying to get more history, more information. Hey, where have you gone? What pharmacies? What doctors? Can I get a hold of somebody that can at least confirm the story? Of course, none of that works out. Um, I finally decide to be a good cop. And you know how in the mini blinds they have the little holes where the, where the uh, line runs down? Well, you can actually, if you get close enough, you can see through the little holes to see what's going on. And the room that he's in, it's got a big window. So I just kind of snuck up there, and I sat there for about five minutes. And I could see the patient moaning, but also looking around like this. Um, I could see him putting his finger down his throat to vomit. So that's where the vomit was coming from. And at one point, he got out of the gurney, got onto the floor, and started doing push-ups. <laughs> and that's when I said, hmm, OK, now I understand the diaphoresis and the tachycardia, sweating and a rapid heart rate. So I walked up to him, and I go, you must be feeling a lot better now. Get that out of my ear <laughs> with your mother. Uh, so you know, this is just one of many stories. I can tell you stories about guys that purposely dislocate their shoulders. I can tell you stories about people that would fake seizures to the point where they got intubated and put into a barbiturate coma, yet the EEG shows no seizure activity. Um, people will do actual harm to themselves to seek these narcotics. And I live in Los Angeles. That's the entertainment capital of the world, right? I got some really good actors out down there. <laughs> and so sometimes it's not as easy as this guy to pick it all up. You have to do a lot of work to find it. So just because we write the narcotic prescriptions doesn't always mean that it's because we understood the disease. Sometimes it's because we got fooled into believing that the patient had something. This guy did a little too much research on the internet. He picked a disease that was probably a little too far out there. And that kind of started the process down the wrong way for him. So we have two options. Either we can continue doing things as we're doing, which is put our head in the, the uh, or bury our heads in the sand, or we can do something about it. In a conference like this, where we have a great number of the people involved in this problem uh, sitting around the table discussing solutions, is the best way to get this process started. Uh, I can tell you from a public health perspective, this is a pro public health problem, and we need to address it in a multidisciplinary uh, fashion. That's the only way that you can address public health problems. So let's talk a little bit about the, the problems. Um, and this is data that has been recently, that recently came out. We only have 4.6% 4. 4. of the world population, yet we're consuming 80% of opiates uh, in the world, and 99% of all the hydrocodone that's produced. Now, Vicodin is the trade name that most people know, but their hydrocodone comes in many forms and many different uh, brand names. So I want to make sure that when we say Vicodin, we're talking really about hydrocodone because it involves things like Norco and other formulations that all have trade names. Um, I don't think it's necessarily fair that, that we just use Vicodin because then we're giving a pass to the other one. So let's focus on using the word hydrocodone because we need to capture the entire problem here. Um, the uh, drug czar has said that in his perspective, the, the biggest uh, challenge that has come from all these uh, narcotic prescription abuses have come from the management of moderate pain with narcotics. And I think that we can do better as providers 
um, it, to, to wear, manage pain without the first line of the pain management being narcotics. And interestingly enough, he thinks that this problem started about 10 years ago, which is the same time that we were really focusing on under, under treatment of, chronic, of pain in general. And we, we had to go through training. I think pharmacists as well as physicians had to go through 12 hours of pain management training. Uh, we had the pain management guidelines. We really went overboard in trying to figure out how to manage pain effectively. Um, the CDC says that uh, drug overdose dose deaths have tripled in the years that they've been keeping records now. Um, I think that there's also been a change, and you'll see this in the statistics in a minute, that it used to be that it was the heroin addict that would overdose in a street alley and die, and that was the drug-related deaths or the accidental or intentional overdoses. Yet nowadays, it's actually prescription drugs that are causing most of the overdoses, and we're seeing very little of the other type. Uh, people are not killing themselves by taking you know, a bottle full of, full of uh, Tylenol uh, for the most part. Uh, they're taking you know, the Vicodin, they're taking uh, the somas, uh, the uh, clonopins, all the other um, anxiolytics, barbiturates, uh, phenobarbital, uh, uh, opiates that we're prescribing. Um, in addition to that, this is just the tip of the iceberg when we're talking about people that are dying as a result of uh, overdoses. You can see that for every one of those, there's a number of uh, ER admissions entering into treatment program. Uh, and uh, uh, people who abuse uh, are dependent or just frankly misabusing a prescription that was never even intended for them. Uh, that's the case. My daughter is uh, finishing at USC right now, and uh, that's, that's the case at, uh, the, in, the, uh, that, in her age group. She's 22 right now. Uh, that basically one kid has a prescription for, um, oh, I'm blanking on uh, the name uh, um, of the medicine for ADHD. Uh, 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 yeah, Adderall, thank you. And uh, that kid begins to sell the Adderall around campus because all the kids want to avoid sleep and, uh, when they're getting prepared for exams and the like. So uh, the misabuse of prescriptions is a huge problem for us. So the people that are most at risk, um, people with multiple prescriptions coming from multiple physicians, that's a Heath Ledger story, that's an Anna Nicole Smith story. We know those very well here in California. Um, People who take highly daily dosages of prescription painkillers uh, or misuse or abuse uh, prone prescription drugs. Uh, low income people, which is an interesting fact, and then below that you'll see that people on Medicaid are, are at higher risk. And I, I have to tell you, my thinking on that is that that's related to the fact that low income poor, who are the people that are on Medicaid and Medi-Cal in our state, tend to be the people that are the laborers. So they develop a lot of muscular skeletal pain to start with, and they have some access to healthcare. So they're showing up to a doctor's office or the ER looking for pain relief for their musculoskeletal pain. I would tell you um, from my uh, police uh, uh, academy, uh, there were 29 of us that finished the police academy. And of those 29, only three of us are not physically or mentally disabled uh, after, and this was 1999, I think I finished the police academy. So uh, there are many jobs out there, firefighters, police officers, uh, lots of laborer jobs in, throughout our state that are very physically demanding and that end up with, with a lot of musculoskeletal uh, complaints and chronic pain. Um, and uh, finally, obviously, people with mental illnesses, dual diagnosis, folks with uh, substance abuse problems, they're likely to get into trouble uh, when we uh, start uh, over prescribing to them also. Um, in addition to that, almost all, all overdose deaths, as I told you recently, come from physician prescriptions. And uh, once they, uh, the prescriptions are prescribed and dispensed, the drugs themselves are frequently diverted. I would tell you that at the, uh, both the Hubert Humphrey Urgent Care and the Martin Luther King, um, the, what used to be a hospital, it's now just a set of outpatient clinics, their urgent care, they're surrounded by halfway houses and treatment centers. And the game is for one person to go in, usually they send somebody that's believable, an elderly person with history of chronic back pain or something like that, so you'll feel sorry for them. They'll get a prescription for Vicodin, Norcos, whatever they're gonna get, 
and uh, they go, they turn it over, and they sell the pills individually on the street. It's a great way to make money. And uh, pill prices go anywhere between $1 and $10 a pill, depending on how good of a prescription you got. So if it's just Tylenol number three, you're only going to get a buck for them. If you got some uh, good Vicodin or maybe Vicodin ES or, or 10 Norcos, uh, boy, you're doing good. If you manage to get Oxy, uh, OxyContin, boy, that's great because, uh, as you guys know, OxyContin can be injected also. Uh, many of the IV drug users will grind down the tablet and inject it. So. Um, it uh, depends, you know, there's a market out there for that, and that market is being financed by uh, the county health care systems or, in some cases, Medicaid. Um, uh, and as I told you, uh, there's a lot of diversion of these drugs. Um, so let me give you also a little an another anecdotal um, observation of mine. My uh, younger brother uh, lives in the island of Curacao in the Caribbean. Uh, my father and mother are from Venezuela, where I was born. And uh, my father passed away a number of years back from prostate cancer. As you guys know, once prostate cancer goes to the bones, it becomes very painful. You get pathological fractures and so forth. Um, my father never received any narcotic pain medications. He was managed with all types of additional modalities, and in some cases, uh, just NSAIDs. Uh, Tylenol and stuff. The most that he ever took, and it's because I went and I got it for him, was some Tylenol number three that I picked up at a local pharmacy because over there you didn't need a prescription for that. Um, but he did, he frankly did pretty well in the late, late stages. My younger brother, um, about five years ago, had necrotizing fasciitis and he almost died as a result of it. Um, when he was in the ICU and pre and post operative care, he got about two days worth of. Uh, epidurals, and then he was switched to oral pain medications, none of them which included narcotics. And uh, he did just fine. Uh, he was uncomfortable for a little bit. We uh, found ways to treat his pain to make sure, particularly around dressing changes times, uh, we, we uh, had a strategy for managing his pain, and he did just fine. And, and the, the reason I'm telling you this is that overall in this country, we're highly dependent on opiates for when it comes to pain management. And frankly, in the rest of the world, that's not the way it is. They're highly regulated elsewhere. In many countries, you can't even buy it from a regular pharmacy. You have to go to a state or a, a federally run pharmacy in which the, the government is controlling the access to narcotics. So um, I think that we need to look at the rest of the world for some ideas of how we better manage pain and how we better control access to narcotics. Um, so, as I told you before, I'm glad you're all here because I think that the uh, fact that you're here shows that you're ready to dialogue about the, the, the problems that we have and to start looking at solutions that we need to do. And uh, this is not a one-sided communi communication. It's the one juvenile hippo is yelling at the other and the other one is uh, looking back and saying, what are you talking about? Uh, it's really a dialogue that we need to have and a communication amongst the, the different folks. Um, so, let's talk briefly, uh, you know, Pain, it's not just pain. There's a variety of pain forms, and we need to start addressing what we treat with uh, what remedies. So uh, certainly acute pain in many cases uh, may require narcotic. If you have a fracture, if you have appendicitis, um, if you have gallstones, you may need a narcotic to get over the uh, problem. But if you have kidney stones, frankly, uh, narcotics don't work. Uh, narcotics, and I can tell you from personal experience, I've had two of them, uh, what works is NSAIDs. And NSAIDs control the pain right away, and there's no dependence issues and the like. Uh, likewise, uh, chronic low back pain, the first line of defense or the first line of treatment is not narcotics. It is anti-inflammatories. Uh, muscle relaxers so don't work. If you have an acute exacerbation, maybe you need a little bit of narcotics. But physical therapy, uh, range, uh, uh, range, mo uh, range of motion, exercises, and the like is what is known to help. Uh, sickle cell pain, on the other hand, does require narcotics because we know, we know that narcotics assist in controlling the pain, but these patients are, are subject to high degree of abuse. And then we have to start talking about acute on chronic pain exacerbations, which are, uh, have their own problems on its own. So let's talk about some of the things that you should keep in mind for your discussions. Chronic pain is generally poorly uh, uh, diagnosed and managed, so we need to understand what the reason for the chronic pain and also understand how to better manage that pain. Um, we certainly need to start looking at all the prescriptions that we're over-prescribing. It's not just narcotics, but it's also benzos 
or anxiolytics, uh, so for the non-medical people, the Valiums of the world, uh, uh, things like barbiturates, and then even antibiotics. Um, I've had some of my physicians uh, get patient complaints because they, did, they felt that a, a kid did not require an, an, an antibiotic and they didn't prescribe it as they should, yet they faced uh, complaints from patients, from hospital administrators and the likes because they didn't issue an antibiotic. And if, it's, if that's happening with just the antibiotics, imagine what's happening with the narcotics. Um, certainly, uh, there's a high dependence uh, on opiates for initial treatment of pain, and we need to start giving physicians, hospitals, other physician extenders the ability to say no by providing a system around them that uh, is supportive of them, not punitive, which is, I think, the mistake that was made with, in the message that was sent with the pain management guidelines in the past. So we need to start looking at it. At, uh, there's an entire system of uh, pain management that we have to create in an environment in which providers feel comfortable saying no when it's not medically indicated. Um, we certainly don't have good access to primary care pain management specialists or other drug treatment programs. Um, also, there's a great deal of conflict between physicians being um, caregivers, gatekeepers, and then being regulated uh, licensed professionals. Uh, I'm very comfortable confronting a patient who has a bad story because I used to be a cop, but most people you don't have that background. They don't have that training and experience to confront somebody, and frankly, most of them didn't get into healthcare to confront people. They're, he they're healers, and so we need, uh, if we're gonna do more training, it has to be on a good approaches for managing conflicts and to resolve conflicts without getting physicians and other providers in trouble. Uh, we also need, have a great focus on uh, uh, patient satisfaction, uh, both by health plans and hospitals, and that's leading to more abuse because doctors are feeling fearful of not giving that prescription and getting a bad patient satisfaction score, being in front of the hospital CEO, getting downgraded by the uh, health plan that they're on, and not getting future business. Um, uh, it, it, we also have mixed messages and uh, a, a very strong U.S. recreational drug culture that we need to deal with. Uh, you know, we're telling patients that it's not okay to abuse drugs, yet we have, quote unquote, medical marijuana, uh, which, by the way, 10 years after medical marijuana became uh, illegal in our state, I have patients coming back to me and say, I've tried it, it doesn't work. Uh, can I get something that actually works? Um, and uh, so hopefully we're going full circle on that one. Um, that we need to start looking at, um, at uh, drug and alcohol abuse as diseases and not necessarily as crimes, but there is a role for law enforcement in there. And we need more communication between law enforcement, the board, our lawmakers, and providers, both physicians and pharmacists out there to make sure that we're, uh, we're all on the same page. Uh, certainly boundary violations by physicians and occasionally the criminal prescribing by physicians is a problem but I think those are quite small. I think I've covered a lot of my recommendations, so I'm gonna zoom through this real quick. Uh, uh, I, as I told you before, I think we need to start looking at the board's guidelines for prescribing controlled substances and for pain, and they probably need to be updated. Um, we meet, need to be comfortable with the notion that not all pain requires opiates, that uh, there are many strategies for controlling pain that don't require all, all, um, uh, opiates. We need a clear, set of guidelines that supports the providers that are in patient contact uh, to make sure that they feel comfortable saying no when they need to say no when it's not medically indicated, uh, not being worried about being second guessed uh, by a hospital's health plans or regulators. Um, we need to remove, um, let's see, um, uh, if uh, uh, patients with chronic pain must really be managed by their primary care provider, uh, pain management specialists, and uh, doctor shopping and visiting the ER should be discouraged. I think that in the near future, that's more likely to happen as the president's health care plan takes effect and more people have access to health care. Um, but it won't solve all the problems. Um, patients with chronic conditions that are, that are seeking narcotics on a regular basis, we need more information on cures. And for our regulators, things like uh, having a, a database that provides us a diagnosis, a PMD with contact information, and a copy of the pain contract would be hugely effective uh, in us managing those patients when they show up um, in the emergency department. Uh, we also have to eliminate paper prescriptions, period. 
Uh, that is leading to the, uh, the theft of our numbers, the DEA and uh, license numbers. It leads to phone calls for refills and all that. There's technology out there where we could put a barcode with all that information on the prescription. Barcodes cannot be photocopied. So we know that that's a one-time prescription and it's not going to continue to be carried on. Uh, certainly things like having a PIN number associated with your DEA if you're calling in a prescription would be very helpful to stop fraud and abuse. Uh, and uh, also our emer uh, electronic medical records have all kinds of information. We should be able to transmit electronic prescriptions directly to a selected pharmacy of the patient's choosing. Um, the, uh, we, we also need to worry about uh, uh, handling complaints when they relate to um, uh, physicians' performance when they are saying no to prescribing medications. Uh, again, we don't want it to be a punitive uh, setting, which is kind of what we've created up till now. And uh, Medi-Cal, Medicare, and private insurance have to establish systems for monitoring. If you have insurance and you're abusing the system, we should be able to find out about it much earlier than we are right now. Uh, pharmacies and the pharmacy board and DOJ definitely need greater flexibility in implementing pres prescription drug monitoring programs. And I think that, frankly, we need to talk to our Fed colleagues about HIPAA and the restrictions that HIPAA is imposing on us and sharing that information. And, uh, and we need their assistance in, in uh, modifying HIPAA. Um, I, I would love to sit around the table with the folks from uh, DOJ and Cures and everybody else and, and really talk about some of these problems. And so I stand ready to work on, uh, on uh, uh, these broad-based uh, strategies with all the party, parties that uh, want to be involved. And um, uh, one last thing I do want to mention before I open it up for a couple questions. I want to make sure that we also focus on the patients that are coming to the ER seeking injectable narcotics but that they never fill a prescription when they're discharged from the hospital. Those folks never show up on the CURES database because they're not filling a prescription. And this happens two ways. Either one, the patients are smart. They know that they'll never show up on CURES if they're not seeking an actual prescription. But number two is if you're indigent or poor and you're not going to have money to fill that prescription, you're never going to fill it. So you just keep returning to the ER for the injectable narcotics. We need cures to figure out a way to capture that information so that we have a more robust uh, database on uh, how the patients are using the system. Um, let's see. I think that, so yeah, yeah, I get, I'm getting the hook. One last thing for any uh, media lawmakers and regulators, I encourage you to come and spend a day in the ER with any uh, board certified emergency physician around the state. And my college, American College of Emergency Physicians, the California chapter has a program that allows us to do that. And so I encourage you to give them a call and come and spend some time with us so you can understand the problem. Um, I'm going to show you and I'm going to leave up a little slide while there's any questions or comments about um, uh, a program that they're doing in San Diego right now that has done exactly what I've talked about, which is to bring together all these groups and begin talking about how to control uh, narcotic prescriptions. And this is what they've come up with. This is what they're posting around, the, around all emergency rooms in San Diego County in order to fight the, the problems that we have with inappropriate prescriptions. So I don't know if we have any time at all for questions, <laughs> but I'll be around. Yeah, yeah. I will be around the rest of the day for any comments or questions. Okay, good morning. I usually don't need a mic, because those of you that know me know. I was surprised the back of the room couldn't hear me. Um, before we go any further, um, I'm Virginia Harrell. I'm with the Board of Pharmacy. It's, I'm the executive officer, and thank you all for coming. This is a real important um, forum for the Medical Board and the Board of Pharmacy. It shows that we actually can work together as two different regulators, regulating different things. The one thing that strongly unifies us is our consumer protection mandate. So one of the things before we move on, I want to make sure that those of you in the room that are trying to get CE have actually signed in at the tables outside for your CE. If you have not signed in this morning, you will not get CE today. Make sure you do it this morning. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker. 
It's my privilege to introduce one of my colleagues. This is Judy Nurse. Judy Nurse is a um, Board of Pharmacy Supervising Inspector. Um, she's graduated from the USC School of Pharmacy and she received a PharmD degree. She's worked in the private sector for 20 years in retail and long-term care settings and in hospitals as well. She, Judy oversees our drug diversion and fraud team and she's done that for a number of years. She has extensive experience investigating pharmacy fraud and corresponding responsibility issues for the board. So it's absolutely my privilege and my honor to introduce my colleague, Dr. Nurse. Okay. Dr. Caesar and the medical board have got nothing on the pharmacy board. We got the animal pictures here too. Okay? My animal pictures, however, are supposed to be calming. I don't do the little niceties and, you know, funny jokes and things like that because I'm not really a funny person. So I figured you've all been away for a day or two. You know, you talk to your wife, you talk to work, you texted the kids. For those of us who are dog people, here's the dog. So anyway. Ratchet it down a couple of degrees and know that you'll make it through the next half hour. Okay, first thing we want to do is we want to decide that anybody that's a legitimate pain patient with a legitimate prescription, we got a pharmacy that's going to fill it, they're going to consult when they need to, they're going to get the appropriate monitoring, and we can set those patients aside and not worry about them. Those are not the people we're talking about today. Okay, we need to talk about corresponding responsibility this morning. That's my subject. Um, not to belabor this, I think probably we talked about it yesterday, but just to know what the code section says so we know what we're supposed to do. A prescriber is supposed to write a prescription for a legitimate medical purpose as a part of his normal practice. He's responsible, for, he or she is responsible for that prescription, but a pharmacist has a corresponding responsibility when they fill the prescription. Down at the bottom of this slide is also a federal code section, and there's a very similar federal code that basically says the same thing. So if somebody's in violation of this, it's pretty hard not to be in violation of the federal section also. Okay, we have an additional California code that talks about erroneous and uncertain prescriptions. This one says, if a pharmacist gets a prescription that has an error, an omission, irregularity, uncertainty, ambiguity or alteration, they have to call the prescriber and validate the prescription. The second part of that says, if after speaking to the prescriber for a controlled substance prescription, if you know or have objective reason to know that that prescription is not for legitimate medical purpose, you should not fill the prescription. So after looking at those two, it gives us the idea that the code sections envision a pharmacist having some type of a decision process regarding controlled substances. And then in an ideal world, it'd be not as if you could say, I write the prescription, you fill it. Just be quiet and fill it. But we're not in a perfect world, and so these, these are the ways that we need to deal with these issues. Now before we go on again, just let me say, I know if I was a prescriber and I read that, I'm going, oh great, so now I got a pharmacist going to second, you know, double check her be on my back over everything I write, or whatever. And just so you know, I'm trying to provide a pharmacist perspective of the issues today. So 99% of what a pharmacist is going to call you about or inquire of your office about is in no way a challenge of what you're ordering or your practice. Um, I want you to kind of understand that we come to the issue from a little different perspective than you do. And so maybe if you just kind of you know, listen to that a little bit and kind of just get an idea. These code sections that I'm talking about are not new. Um, the corresponding responsibility one's been around since about 1982. The others kind of around the same time period. So, you know, since I've been with the board in the mid-90s, until probably the last three or four years, we maybe investigated one or two of these cases a year. The last three or four years, we now have at least 39 open investigations in Southern California alone. That's Fresno South. So we're being inundated by this issue. Now, and I say, you know, we investigate complaints. That means these issues are brought to us. 
Um, Janice, the lady in the gray suit standing against the wall, is another supervising inspector. She does the same thing I do. She and I do diversion and fraud. It's not like Janice and I sit around at night with baseball caps pulled down over our eyes looking through thousands of pages of cures data for one errant prescription. These pharmacies are way out of the bell curve and they are problematic and so we need to deal with that. I'll talk to you about some of our dirty laundry and then I'll talk of you about some of the combination doctor pharmacy dirty laundry. Um, our world has changed. We get to the point where we kind of have to be part of the solution or we're part of the problem. I liken it to the TSA issue. I mean, I'm not saying this is like 9-11, but it's like when we all go to the airport and in our own ways we all hate going through security, you know, but what are you going to do? The world has changed and we have to do what we have to do. And our world has also changed, you know, whether we like it or not. As we talked about yesterday, the popular drugs of abuse right now are what we dispense. For many years that was something very distant. It was some weird controlled substance, Schedule One that we kind of didn't pay any attention to, and unless you were an addictionologist, you didn't pay any attention, you tried to move around it. Now it's our drugs that they're abusing, so we have to modify what we're doing in some way. There's a criminal element in our pharmacy industry that was never there. And so we have to look at that. I have a list of them here that I don't really have time to go over, but we have, you know, I'm sure things that were discussed yesterday. Organized drug, ring, drug rings, gangs, all, you know, all sorts of stuff that we didn't used to have. Physicians have had to change their practice. Pharmacies are having to change the way we practice. Pharmacies are spending inordinate amounts of time and in some instances money on basically securing the drugs. You know, large businesses like um, hospitals, Kaiser, various entities pay huge amounts of money basically securing the drugs. Um, theft is skyrocketing out of pharmacies. I'm sure you heard that yesterday. Uh, not only do they have to watch the drugs, which they never used to have to do. Nobody, years ago, nobody ever thought that anybody would steal a drug out of a pharmacy. Now they're stealing them right and left. Um, you have to have awareness of all the controlled substances you dispense. You're paranoid about that. And so, you know, things have changed. And at the end of the day, these are very highly regulated drugs. I mean, what do we think of that's more regulated really than this? From the minute that drug powder hits the United States border until it goes to the patient, it's in a licensed, regulated atmosphere. And even when it gets to the patient, there's a notice on the bottle that says you can't transfer it to anyone. So they're still making, the, these drugs are still making their way to the street. So how are they doing it? Two ways. They either steal it out of a licensed entity that has it. So they have to steal it from a manufacturer, a wholesaler, a pharmacy, or any of you who still might have it in your offices. Or they have to pass prescriptions at pharmacies in some ways to get the items. There's no other way for them to get them. It's a closed system. So they have limited access. That's why we have gangs and groups of diverters and things like that. People that are part of the old drug culture are moving into our industry and in sort of invading it. Okay, what do we tell pharmacies when we do training? We say two things. Once you order it, once you have it, don't let anybody steal it from you. Secondly, only dispense prescriptions for a legitimate medical purpose. And if you did those two things, perfectly in an ideal world, there'd be very little of this drug on the street. But then we have, you know, then we have issues. And a lot of the issues, like I talked to you about, you're going to get phone calls about some of this stuff. And please understand, we're just trying to, you know, trying to work with this issue. We all have to kind of work with it. Um, a lot of these things are internal pharmacy things that have really nothing to do with you, but the only solution sometimes is to call you the prescriber. Stolen prescription blanks. Now that's an issue. You probably, if you had them stolen, you've reported them four or five places. Two and a half years from now, you're still getting phone calls about these blanks, and you will continue to get phone calls because there's no deposit, there's no database, there's no repository where anyone can report or any pharmacist can check to see if your if your prescriptions have been stolen. We have altered prescriptions. We have fraudulent called-in prescriptions. 
Just so you know, any prescription that's called into a pharmacy or faxed into a pharmacy, we have a code section that says the pharmacy, the pharmacy needs to identify the patient if they don't know the patient. We've had patients complain that they can't come up with an ID that matches the name on the prescription. So, so somebody you know, didn't fill their prescription. We have totally fraudulent security blanks, as was just discussed. You know, they take your name, your DEA number, they change the phone number and the address, and the phone number that the pharmacy calls is the cell phone of the drug dealer. We have you know, pharmacy staff that are stealing. We have pharmacy staff that just data enter stuff in the, you know, into the computer, no prescription for it. Data enter refills, no prescription, and then they steal it. Now they're playing with the inventory so that when somebody does data mining, it doesn't show inventory shrinkage. So you know, everybody's got, everybody's got a thing. Now I come to the part where the physicians and the pharmacies play together, okay? Not necessarily together, but you know, they're helping each other. We got a pharmacy in LA. Older ethnic area, very highly Jewish-Israeli community. You would, in, those in the South, if I gave you the intersection, you'd know. And so we go into that pharmacy. We have 1,800 prescriptions dispensed by one doctor. He's out of the area. The patients are out of the area. The pharmacist's attitude of corresponding responsibility in that pharmacy was, I only fill four or six of these a day. I fill them early in the morning because my regular patients are afraid of the patients that come in. And I only, I only fill less than 120, keep the quantities low. And if I do five or seven of those a day, I up my income by 80,000. That's corresponding responsibility. Okay, the next one, oh, back. Prescribers in the San Fernando Valley, pharmacy in LA. Patients are everywhere. 45 prescription containers, empty, found in the trash in Oceanside. All of those, all that stuff was emptied out of the bottles. All those drugs are, were, for quite a while, the source of the illegal hydrocodone in northern San Diego County. It was also going to Mexico, because Mexico does not have hydrocodone or Vicodin. All the Vicodin that's sold in Tijuana pharmacies has come across the border from the US, and then Americans come over and buy it. But, but anyway, so that's another example. You know, we had a doctor writing those, and we had a pharmacy gladly filling those. Next one, Central Valley Pharmacy. Dispenses about 15 cases of, pres of promethazine and codeine a week. I can't really remember the total. 15 is not right, but you know, I can't remember. It was huge, that's all I know and a week. The prescriptions are written mainly by doctors in the Fresno area, one doctor in LA. And the pharmacist had no idea where the doctors were. He had no idea anything about the patients. And his idea of corresponding responsibility was, if doctor writes it, I fill it. We called the doctor in LA. The doctor in LA uh, had four patients. He knew he had two sets of husbands and wives. He didn't know they were all related. He didn't know they were all going to Fresno to get their prescriptions filled. And he didn't know that they were all changing the quantities from 180 to 480. Oops. So anyway, you know, so it's a combination of these, you know, it's a combination of these things. So you may have a doctor who's okay, but the patient is bad, and then the patient's gonna go to Fresno because he knows he can get the prescription filled there. And once again, the attitude of corresponding responsibility is if the doctor writes it, I fill it. Okay, how does the pharmacist determine if, uh, where am I? How does the pharmacist determine if a prescription's written for a legitimate medical purpose? Okay, please remember, usually the pharmacist doesn't have a medical record, like you do or some, you know, anybody else does. We've got no medical record. If you're in a Kaiser or if you're in an acute <coughs> hospital, you do, a clinic, but average retail pharmacy doesn't have a medical record to look at. So we have the patient to talk to, we have the prescription that you have written, we have the patient profile that we have of, that documents anything else we've filled for the patient, but if we haven't filled anything else for the patient, we don't have that. We have cures and we have communication with the prescriber. And that's what we have to make a decision from. So sometimes you're gonna get weird calls that you're not gonna like and you're gonna be bothered and you're gonna be ticked off. But, you know, please understand that there's a pharmacist out there that's just madly trying to figure out what's going on. 
Now, we've talked mainly about small pharmacies. I'm going to talk about chain stores a little because they have their issues too. Most of them don't regularly check cures. They all have interstore databases so they can fill prescriptions between stores, right? But they rarely check it. So they can have doctor shoppers just within their own chain. And so they also have a lot of pharmacists, a lot of change of staff, whatever. And you know, patients will, will seek out. They'll find the easy pharmacy, the pharmacist. They'll know what his shift is. And they'll get their prescriptions filled then. OK. Pharmacist responsibilities. Back one. Okay. We talk to pharmacists and we say, what's your responsibility? You have to have a patient pharmacy relationship. Do you know anything about your patient? If the patient walked in the front door of the pharmacy, would you recognize them? Would you know them? What do you know about the patient? What do you know about, what do you know about what's wrong with the patient? What do you know about the meds that they take? What, what do you know? You have to have a, there has to be a patient prescriber relationship. We use this a lot with internet prescriptions. How do you as a pharmacist know that that doctor and that patient have any relationship at all? The doctor's in Florida and the patient's in California. Do you think there was a good faith medical exam? I don't know. Um, you have a pharmacy prescriber relationship. What does the pharmacy know about the doctor? Do they know that the doctor's in LA when their practice in Fresno? Do they know what the doctor's specialty is? Is he, you know, is it an OBGYN and a pediatrician and we're getting all these OxyContin prescriptions? You know, some of these things you have to kind of know. So, you know, or the prescriber. Do you know enough about the prescriber to know if you got a prescription that was out of the ordinary? Do you know what the prescriber normally orders, what he does? Then we say, pharmacist, you have to consider the prescription document, the prescriber, the patient, and the drug therapy. Now, this is about the time when we're doing training that we take a break. We're not taking a break now, but when we take the break, I invariably have somebody that comes up to me, and in a big, loud voice, they'll say to me, I'm never filling another OxyContin prescription again. And then they'll talk a little longer and they'll say, and I'm not going to fill any Vicodins either. And so then we have to back up and we say, no, that's not, that's not the deal. Um, we don't want you to fill anything that comes in the door. But the solution, you can obviously choose if you own your own pharmacy not to handle controlled substances or whatever. But in reality, the solution is not then to not fill anything. The solution is that you have gone to school for eight years to be a pharmacist. And if you did a residency, you probably went nine or 10. And you're the person that has the knowledge to make that decision. And you need to stand up and make the decision thoughtfully and, you know, thoughtfully um, when the time comes. And you don't just ignore it. You don't just go the other way. That's also the time that I usually get the guy that comes up and says, I have a patient that needs 4,000 dilaudid a month. And I can't get a pharmacy to fill it. And I think we ought to change the law so that whatever I write, the pharmacy just needs to fill. And so then, you know, my, my gut tells me, you know, that's got to be a unique, truly unique situation. How many patients are you going to have like that? And you know, you might give the patient a little warning. You know, you might say to the patient, this is a rather unusual order. It may take your pharmacy a couple of days to get it. If you have a pain agreement, you might send a copy of the pain agreement to the pharmacy. You might say, if the pharmacist has any questions, ask him to call. I'll be glad to talk to him. And so that you have this little three-way thing going so that everybody, you'll have a pharmacy that will fill the prescription if they know what the heck is going on and they know that you've got one of these patients and not 45 or 50 of them. And so we all just need to try and cooperate a little bit. OK. We talk about evaluation of the prescription document. We have you know, California security prescriptions. Uh, we still have some docs that won't get security documents. They write everything on a plain prescription. They can't do that for twos, but they can for three through five. So then the pharmacist has to call and turn everything into a telephonic order. If any of the elements of the security document are missing, then, we have to, then the pharmacy has to call you. Also, um, there are only two elements on a, on a prescription that you have to handwrite 
and that's your signature and the date. So if you have a prescription that generates from your computer that has the date already printed, write the date in. In addition to the fact that it's already there, hand write it in. The code section says it will be written in pen. Signature and date. Okay. In addition, if you have a computer-generated prescription that, that creates a digital signature and you fax it to the pharmacy, the pharmacy can't take a faxed digital signature. If you're going to fax that, you need to sign it. An electronic prescription needs to be transferred, or whatever you want to call it, on a, an audited or certified software program that attests to the fact that that software program meets the requirements of the DEA code sections. And so if, if, if you have that software, then you can transmit prescriptions, provided the pharmacy has the software to receive them. So we're probably in some mode of you know, in-betweenness right now, because this isn't totally implemented yet. But just so you kind of understand some of those things. Prescriber information, we ask them to look, find out a few things about a prescriber that they don't know that's out of their area, or you know, that's, that's confusing to them. We ask for them to evaluate patients. You know, like I said, do they, can they identify the patients? Do they ever get a cures report? Do they have any idea? We're going to talk about cures reports you know, several times today. But you know, we, have, we have one doctor shopper case, and we have, I think we have 13 pharmacies. I know we did 13 pharmacy inspections, and I think we had 28 doctors in two years. And they're all right in like Beverly Hills little area. And so, you know, you got to look at that cures report every once in a while. Um, who picks up the prescriptions? This is an interesting thing that has started in pharmacies. Um, for years, husbands and wives have picked up their own prescriptions. Parents have picked up their children's prescriptions. Adult children have picked up their elderly patients, you know, their elderly parents' prescriptions. You knew the people. You knew why they did this. We now have patients that are showing up with a prescription, you know, with like Oxycontin, uh, Hydrocodone, Alprazolam, and Soma. Attached to that is a copy of their driver's license, and attached to that is a pre-printed form that allows a driver to pick up the prescription for the patient. And we have also seen those documents notarized. Now, you know, anybody that brought me that form or, or a stack of those forms, it's, what's really nice is you'll get like about 10 or 20 prescriptions that you fill in a row that all have that attached to them. You know, if anybody brought me one of those, I'd like run for the hills. But anyway, so that's just something that's, you know, that's occurring with us. We look at some other patient information. We evaluate the drug. Something that's happening right now is kind of a little movement on that concept of narcotic naive. Um, the diverters are, are changing the patient names all the time. So if you go into cures, you won't see any data on the patient for maybe six months or whatever. You won't find the patient. They keep changing the patients. But you'll get a prescription that says Oxycontin, Vicodin, and blah, 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 the same four. Now, what, you know, what pain management doctor starts a person on Oxycontin that's narcotic naive and hasn't had anything in six months? So, that's just one of the things that they tend to be doing right now. OK, we ask pharmacists to evaluate their own practice. We say, think about what would cause you to refuse to fill a prescription. You know, sit down and think about it. What would you do when, what do you do when these red flags or your gut tells you not to fill it? Do you investigate further? Do you try to figure out more what's going on? Or do you just put your head down and fill it? Um, what do you do when that van comes in? I'm sure Mr. Dr. Anasizi discussed yesterday the van loads of people that come in and get out and get the prescriptions filled and whatever. Um, what do you do when that van load shows up at your pharmacy? Um, what kind of training, you know, if you decide you're going to fill these large numbers of controlled substance prescriptions, if you're going into the pain business, what specialized training do you have as a pharmacist that would allow you to make appropriate decisions? So if you don't feel comfortable or you don't know, then maybe you better go out and, 
you know, and try to seek some training. And we say, you know, pharmacists, do you thoughtfully and professionally embrace the issue of corresponding responsibility? Do you avoid it, turn away from it, you know, or just take the money? And then we look at documentation, and uh, we also talk about cures reports and pain agreements. Um, you know, I really feel that many times, uh, most, most pain practices have pain agreements, and they have a pharmacy identified. And I would bet that 90% of the time, the pharmacy has no idea that they're the designated pharmacy. So I really think that pain agreements need to go to the pharmacy. The pharmacy needs to know that they are the designated pharmacy. And you know, if you, you have a good pharmacy, they will, they will watch, they will help you. Cures data, we're all talking about cures. It's obviously valuable to all pharmacies, ER docs, urgent care, 24-hour pharmacies seven-day-a-week pharmacies really need this stuff because just like ERs and urgent cares, the 24-hour pharmacies get the same, you know, get the same treatment. Uh, several of the things to look at when looking at these, patients will use multiple birth dates, multiple addresses, multiple doctors. So there we go. I think I've whizzed to the end, and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Nurse. Um, we now have our next panel. Uh, Dr. Setcher will not be joining us today due to illness, and HIPAA requires that I not tell you what he has. Uh, so we have two panel members today. Dr. Dave Greenberg um, is a fourth generation Californian who lives in Arizona and has worked as the Arizona Chief Medical <laughs> Investigator and is an addiction and pain medicine physician. He has served as a consultant and expert witness to the DOJ, the DEA, and the FBI on prescription drug addiction, commercial diversion, and overdose fatalities. Dr. Greenberg is a graduate of UC Davis School of Medicine and later received his Master of Public Health at the University of Arizona. He is board certified in addiction medicine and serves as a contract medical director for the Arizona Physician Health Program. Dr. Darlene Fujimoto is currently Assistant Chief Pharmacy Regulator, Compliance, and Accreditation Volunteer Faculty at Skag School of Pharmacy. She is responsible for oversight of medical center medication use and processes related to the Department of Policy and Procedures. She works with key stakeholders to ensure legal and regulatory practice compliance at UCSD health systems and works with management to provide oversight and accountability of medication use. Before joining UC San Diego, she worked for 14 years in clinical ambulatory care with a focus in geriatric disease management. She served for eight years on the Board of Pharmacy. Doctors? now. Okay, good. Good morning. Unaccustomed as I am to speaking at CME meetings that don't have uh, pharmaceutical booths and free ballpoint pens and candies, I am going to try to proceed. <laughs> uh, at any rate, this is a huge subject. It's a gigantic subject. I was just thinking whether reading over some of my, 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 my rap sheet that it was uh, just a quarter century ago today that I worked my first counter diversion, uh, big counter diversion investigation in the state of Arizona, and it involved a delouted ring, hydromorphone ring, that was smuggling uh, uh, huge amounts of hydromorphone into our maximal state prison in in Arizona, which is which is Florence Prison. Uh, 
Uh, that case did not go well. It went well as far as the investigation, but, uh, but uh, uh, we learned a lot of things about the prison system and what they wanted us as a medical board investigator to do or not do. And, uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was not, it was, it was not a, a rewarding experience. But anyway, it was a learning experience. Uh, you know, the United States is in a situation now, and all I can say is, is this, with reference to, to the, the epidemic that we have, with uh, prescription and drug abuse and diversion and deaths. And, and, and by the way, I'd like to make one comment really important that's really, really important. I do a lot of work also for private health care entities. And these are private health care entities who are concerned about this problem that we're all here for today, not out of compassion, okay? Not out of worrying about the, the probably 50,000 people a year that are dying in this epidemic. And I'll give you why I'll, those numbers, I believe they're different, okay? Than, than what's been quoted by the CDC and others but because the fact that at-risk carriers are losing money on this deal, okay? Everyone else is making money on this out-of-control epidemic, okay? Uh, but the at-risk health care insurance carriers are losing money on it. And some of those are workers' comp, and a lot of them are just regular, regular health insurance type companies. And the deaths don't bother them, okay? Because death is cheap. You got maybe an ambulance ride, uh, maybe you know, get charged for a few shocks in the ER and some epinephrine and bicarb, but, but, but the OD deaths are cheap. The things that they're concerned about are the cost of this epidemic for the people who don't die in their overdoses, the people who wind up in the skilled nursing facilities for the next 45 years and if they're lucky they get their, their diapers changed once or twice a day, okay? The people that wind up in the non-acute critical care hospitals for the rest of their lives. Anyone here ever been to a non-acute critical care hospital? Yeah, a few of you have, okay? Those that haven't need to go, because this is one of the most interesting phenomenons of capitalism and medicine that I've ever seen. It's even better than, 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 the, than, than the, the drug stuff we're going to talk about, okay? And, uh, and uh, it is going to break the bank. There's no doubt about it. When I first toured one of these facilities, a uh, nurse practitioner friend of mine took me around, and it was full of people who'd almost overdosed, but not quite. And they'd killed their upper brain, but they still had reptilian brain. And they were, they were uh, surrounded by family members who were washing their hair and talking to them, et cetera, et cetera. And they had their tracheostomies and their feeding tubes, and everything was going good. And then my nurse practitioner friend told me that she was resigning from this particular facility uh, because the fact that when these people lost their insurance, that day they were declared hospice patients uh, and sent out. But it is, a, it is a great story of capitalism, and you guys should really see it and, and check it out because there's more and more of these. And they don't look like hospitals. They look like office buildings. They're all around us probably some right around here. I don't, I don't know that for, that for sure, but you can't tell the difference because they just look like a regular office building. Okay, let's get into the talk. Uh, my disclaimer is this. I do not, I'm not an abolitionist. I do not believe we should go back to the bad old days. I can remember very clearly uh, earlier in my career when there were people with properly diagnosed, fully worked up, uh, severe medical and surgical types of problems who did not benefit from any other kind of treatment and who could have used opioid analgesia, uh, and some of them could have used opioid analgesia around the clock. So I am not an advocate for going back to abolition or saying that people that really need, need these medicines shouldn't have them, okay? What I'm saying is, is that the United States is unlike any other country in the world in how we go about developing these types of medicines and how we go about prescribing and promoting them and how we go about managing the problems that, uh, that, uh, that come up with it. Believe it or not, there are a lot of civilized countries and some that aren't so civilized that are able to give narcotics to their, pop to their population in proper amounts and proper times uh, with good monitoring, and, uh, and they do it, and they do it, and they don't have a huge drug diversion problem or a huge pills, pain pill to heroin problem. So I want to look at a little bit of the history because it's important. Uh, and I am going to talk about Purdue Frederick here, but Purdue Frederick really did nothing different than what most drug companies do when they market, uh, when they have a marketing plan for new drugs and develop new drugs. The only big difference is, is they did a lot of criminal stuff, okay? But their basic game plan wasn't anything different than, than just the regular, the regular status quo as far as development of drugs and, and marketing. Okay. All right, you guys, I'm going to go through this really quick because you probably all know it. 1995, the FDA approved a deeply flawed formulation of an old drug, oxycodone. Oxycodone's been around for about 100 years, guys. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and it was deeply flawed in, in, in one important way. It wasn't an extended release tablet. Okay. Uh, they, they called it that, but it wasn't. Okay. And it was easily defeated. And this is an important point. 
human beings, mostly drug abusers and drug addicts, have been defeating pharmacologically designed uh, uh, slow release mechanisms ever since they were developed. Okay? I remember when I was a kid in, in San Francisco, kids were getting Dexamils. Dexamil was a combination of Dexedrine and had a little bit of barbiturate in it too to just kind of level you out. And kids were crushing the sustained release pills. And this is back in the, you know, 64, 65 and that kind. So, so when one says that they have an extended release uh, preparation, you need to really, really take a look at it. And unfortunately, the, 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 the FDA didn't really do that. Uh, they also approved the drug for cancer, for cancer pain and severe chronic pain that was not relieved by other types of, of more normal type of treatments, okay? Uh, the, in my opinion, the DEA abdicated their responsibility as far as really considering the risks that were involved in this particular drug. And especially when the, they approved formulations when we went from five milligrams, which was the maximal unit dose of oxycodone for, for decades, okay? all the way up to 160 milligrams. I mean, that's a pretty big jump. Imagine if I came to you guys right now and I said, you know what, we got a problem in this country, okay? We got TAD. So you guys say, what's TAD? I said, well, TAD, TAD is terminal anxiety disorder. You haven't heard of it? It's undertreated. Matter of fact, in the United States, almost no one gets treated for anxiety, okay? Uh, psychiatrists are, aren't prescribing enough and family doctors aren't prescribing enough and it's a real problem and these people are crippled by this disease, okay? So we form a little drug company. We all put in a few hundred bucks today and, 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 uh, and have a drug company. And we come up with a preparation of diazepam. And we're going to do just like what Purdue Frederick did. We're going to increase the maximal dose of diazepam from 10 milligrams to 320. 32 times. OK, why not? And we're going to put it in a bogus, uh, slow release you know, type fashion so that it can easily be crushed and people can get it and, and snort it or shoot it up or whatever they want to do. And we're going to market this and we're also going to take some of the money that you're going to give me for this little project after the meeting and we're going to set up the American Anxiety Foundation. Okay? And we're going to fund it with drug money completely, okay? But we're going to use it as a fake grassroots organization that's going to go to state legislatures and go to DEA, DEA meetings and go to, go to uh, 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 their, their senators and their congressmen and everything like that and shout and scream and claim that anxiety is not being properly treated in the United States of America and that people are dying because of this, okay? Marriages are falling apart because of this. Parents aren't able to parent their children because of this and that, and that we need to take the restrictions off anti-anxiety medicines, especially benzodiazepines and especially our new preparation, okay? How do you think that work, okay? Hey, oh, but the other thing we have to do is get a lot of experts. We have to hire a bunch of experts, give them money, train them what we want to say, and then they're going to go out and talk to all the doctors because these people are the thought leaders, and we'll talk about the thought leaders in just a minute, okay? So that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. Okay, the other, the other thing is, is the problems that we have with the DEA is that most of the drugs in the United States just have to show that, that are approved by the, by the FDA, I'm sorry, uh, just have to show they're better than placebo. I guarantee you, 320 milligrams of diazepam is going to be better than placebo, okay? We're going to whoop that one for sure, okay? And, and of course, the other problem that the, the, that the FDA had is that they really had impotent regulation of off-label, illegal off-label marketing, okay? And that happened a lot. And it's happened a lot by other companies, too, not just Purdue Frederick, but, uh, but it is a problem. Okay. All right, so what did they do? Okay, they ramped up their sales force, and, and, they, and, and, and they got thousands and thousands of, uh, of, of people hired to be, to be detail persons. They also identified thought leaders, and thought leaders doesn't necessarily mean you're the best doctor in the community, it means you are the most influential doctor in the community, okay? And they got the thought leaders and took them to summer camp and resor at resorts and trained them to what they wanted them to say. They paid them good money. And these docs went out, and, and there were lavish dinners all across the United States, tens of thousands of them. And, and these docs talked about all the kind of things we'll talk about in just a minute as far as, as, far as how, um, how great the drug was. Okay? They also set up the fake grassroots organizations, which we're going to copy, as I said before. And they also, uh, they also really went after hospitals uh, and uh, insurance plans. And they came up with all kinds of videos and brochures that they never got approval by the FDA to use to market to patients and stuff like that. Any guys you ever seen any of those, 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 uh, those videos? They were great, man. They were great. I, th th that joke video they showed the other day wasn't that far off from, from the marketing stuff that they had. I mean, it fixed everything <laughs> with no, with no negative, negative consequences. All righty. Okay, these are the mantras that the thought leaders and also to a lesser degree that the, uh, the detail uh, men and detail women would say. 
Number one, this is a lie that still continues. They said that if you undertreat chronic pain, you are going to be sued. Okay? This is bogus. Okay? And what I'd like you to now, right now, all you doctors and everyone here in this, in, this, in, this, in this meeting, how many of you know of a doctor who had a chronic pain patient okay, and noted that this patient had extremely risky behaviors, such as dirty urines, such as not having the drug that was prescribed to them, such as having overdose problems and, and winding up in the ICU for 14 days with a couple of extra pneumonias from aspiration and all that, and documented all these things and therefore said to the patient, no, I'm putting down my foot. 360 30 milligram Percocet tablets, okay, per month is enough for you. I'm not giving you one more. Man, can you imagine there's doctors that tough, you know? They're going to draw the line at 360? Anyway, <laughs> the, and, 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 uh, and then documented in the chart why they did this, because I believe this patient is at high risk for drug diversion, fatal overdose, uh, and, and uh, being in a car wreck or whatever, okay, uh, or overdose, okay? Okay, how many of you are aware of successful lawsuits against chronic pain doctors have done that? Okay, I've looked nationwide. I can't find one. Okay, but this was the mantra that these people were taught at their training camps, and, uh, and people believed it. People believed it. They also said uh, some other funny things. They said that uh, there's basically, we already talked about this, there's basically no risk of addiction with oxycodone. I beg your pardon. It's a Schedule II drug. It's always been a Schedule II drug since we've had Schedule II. It is addicting. Uh, near, zero, near zero respiratory depression in chronic pain patients. Uh, no maximal dose for opioids. You know, you guys, you could, driving is safe on them. Uh, uh, the fact that the, the Q12 didn't even work, even when you took it the right way, people still, the, the effect of it was that it dissolved too quickly, okay? And that people needed to take breakthrough medication. And, and, and of course, breakthrough medication gets you on a whole new, a whole new roller coaster. Uh, the other thing they said, which is very important, and by the way, the United States is the only place in the world, in a civilized country in the world, where you can do this, this, uh, this one that I'm going to talk about right now, and that is it was not only okay, it was great to self-declare yourself, okay, without any training, expertise, education, CME program, nothing, okay? Declare yourself as a chronic pain expert, put that sign up saying you're a chronic pain expert, put it in the phone book and then in the internet, and, and practice medicine as a chronic pain expert, okay? And I can tell you that you can't do that in Canada, okay? You can't do that in England. You can't do that in lots of backwards countries like New Zealand and Australia and France and Italy and Germany and Spain and Sweden and all those places. You can't do that, okay? But in the United States, any of us can do that. I could put up a sign and say I'm a neurosurgeon. I wouldn't get hospital privileges, but these guys, the drug, the drug dealers, they don't need hospital privileges. They don't want hospital privileges, okay? So the United States is, is completely unique in the world with reference to the fact that we allow self-declaration of medical specialties. Also, we allow people to practice without malpractice insurance. Now, if you have a hospital or, or a certain health plan membership, you have to have malpractice. But if I want to go out and open up my specialty clinic in fetal dermatology or, or, or whatever, okay, I don't need, I don't need to have a, a malpractice insurance if it's just my own little office. Okay, so so we, are, we are a very different society. Uh, the, the other thing that, that the marketers used to say, and they said this directly to me many times, and I tape recorded some of the detail men and detail women that came through me because I was up at this little mining clinic, and I couldn't believe the stuff they were saying. Okay? And what they said many times was, Doc, this is a great way for you to build an easy, long-term cash pain practice. And these patients are no problem. They're just going to come in and pick up their medicine. Okay? Uh, that was probably uh, was disingenuous for them to be saying that, but it was, it was, part, of, it was part of the deal. Okay. Other, I'll do the rest of the mantras really quick. Uh, they used to say for years, okay, the, the, probably the first three years when the epidemic was really building, their experts would say, and the, and the detailed people, that urine drug testing is contraindicated in chronic pain patients. And many famous pain doctors at the time also said that, by the way, early in the epidemic, okay, that urine testing was contraindicated because it ruptured the bond of trust between doctors and patients, okay? So what they, accept, that they, what they told doctors to do was fly blind. They told them to practice clairvoyant medicine, okay? So clairvoyant medicine is okay. It saves money on lab fees. When, when Mrs. Gonzalez comes in to see me and, uh, and she's had very brittle diabetic and she's, she's really had some serious, serious complications, okay, and trouble with her insulin and her insulin pump, what I'll do is I'll just divine it. I'll just say, wait a minute. Okay, Mrs. Gonzalez, I've got to give a reading. Yeah, your blood sugar is, is 257. 
okay? So I'm going to rewrite your insulin now without any, without any real uh, data as far as a lab test or anything like that. So they advocated non-scientific practice because it boosted their profits, okay? It, and that's a, that's, 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 that's a truth. That's, that's something that happened, okay? They also said drug diversion is very rare. Um, well, they fixed that. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and that uh, drug overdose was close to impossible due to the extended release matrix that the pill was made up with. Okay, well, that didn't work out so well either. And the other thing they used to say, and the videos really showed it too, is they, they said that basically mo almost all the patients, when you put them on the medicine, are going to have a return to full, pre-morbid, full functioning at work, home, hobby, sex life, being on the church board, everything, okay? It was gonna, it was gonna fix them, and, and that wasn't true. By the way, what's the most famous study that shows that long-term high-dose opioid for non-cancer pain dramatically increases people's functioning in life long-term, like five years now? Do you guys know the authors? That's good, because it's never been done. <laughs> It's never been done, okay? The experiment, okay, is being done on our population. It's not, wasn't done, wasn't done prior to drug release, and that's not something that, that's particular to Purdue Frederick either. That, that's just the way our system works. Okay, Jayco is my favorite piece of this marketing scam, okay? Because what happened was that, and this is by, this is, everything I'm giving you, I'm going to give you the, the General Accountability Office uh, reports that you can read. All this stuff is in the GAO reports, and all of it is also in the, the criminal stuff that happened against and the convictions and everything that happened with, with the OxyContin uh, executives, et cetera. Uh, they went to JCO, okay? And they had a bunch of their thought leaders with them, and, uh, and the thought leaders weren't all physicians. Some of them were also nurses and pharmacists, okay? And to make a long story short, they basically said to Jaco, you know, pain is the fifth vital sign, and you're not treating pain right, and you're going to get sued, and your hospitals are really going to get clobbered, and, and, uh, and you'll probably get fired. I mean, I mean, I mean just the, this, this paranoia thing about not treating pain properly. Now, pain wasn't treated ideally in the United States uh, some years ago, okay? But the fact of the matter is, is that Jaco basically said, well, this is a huge, such a huge thing to change everything. We don't know uh, what we're going to do. And, and it's going to cost a lot of money. Okay, so guess who decided they'd pay for the rewriting of the policies? It was the drug company. It was the drug company. And they did that, and they also got their, uh, their books and materials and everything else on the JCO website for sale. Okay, <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's pretty cozy. That's pretty cozy. In the interest of time, they also rolled up the federal system. Okay, and this happened right in 2003, right before the Gulf War. They rolled up the federal system of hospitals, the military and, and the VA hospitals. So again, brilliant marketing. All righty, um, uncounted epidemics. Okay, the the official stats are that it's thirty thousand a year. Okay, and and I disagree with that. And the reason why is this: How many people practice medicine in rural counties or pharmacy in rural counties? Okay, not that many. Okay, well, all throughout rural America, coroners do not have the latest. Uh, uh, toxicology uh, capabilities, largely because lab testing is expensive. So throughout rural America, lots of the coroners, the only test they test for is they're checking for heroin metabolites. They, so they pick up morphine and codeine, okay? They don't pick up fentanyl like they do, like they do here. They don't pick up oxymorphone. They don't pick up all kinds of drugs, okay? And they certainly don't pick up a lot of the different benzos. So, so it's undercounted for that reason. That, that, that the coroners just aren't up to snuff, okay? Uh, and their testing is not just up to snuff. There's another reason why we undercount it, okay? Doctors, how many of you got comprehensive training on the legal, social, and medical ramifications of filling out death certificates properly in medical school? I know where I got mine. I got it from the VA nurse, okay? <laughs> About 1 a.m. in the ICU. <laughs> My first patient did, I don't know how to fill this out. Oh, here's how you do it, doctor, okay? And nurses taught me a lot of good stuff. Okay, pharmacists too, uh, seriously. So the thing is, is this, what we have in our society is because there's so much, there's so much uh, uh, English you can put on, you can put on a, a death certificate, what happens is, is that in our country, the higher the person's socioeconomic status and the lighter the color of their skin, the less chance there is going to be derogatory information on that death certificate. And think about that, poor doc in a rural county, okay? Just think about this, okay? You're there. 
and a powerful family that owns the logging business and they own, they own some of the big farms and a mine. Uh, one of their, one of their you know, dies of anything. It doesn't have to be pills. It could be alcoholic cirrhosis. It could be, it could be respiratory arrest from oxycodone and, and clonazepam. It could be anything like that, okay? You'll very likely find, as the cause of death, respiratory arrest with no other modifiers. Okay, not, not the secondary two or anything like that. Uh, for cirrhosis of the liver, you'll see liver failure with nothing that says alcoholic cirrhosis. In obituaries, it's even more of a problem. Of course, obituaries aren't really where we're counting from. So we're undercounting this epidemic. You can take that to the bank. The only question is how much are we undercounting it? And I think it's very, very significant because a lot of the even suburban areas now can't afford to do top-notch uh, lab testing because of budget cutbacks, et cetera. Okay, now. Uh, I'm going to finish this up here so that I get plenty of time for Darlene. So somebody, somebody hit me when I, when I get to my last two minutes. Uh, di drug diversion is not, is, not, is, not, is not a victimless crime. Okay? I also spend a couple of days each week working in an indigent clinic for people that are, 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 are addicted to opiates mostly. Okay? Opiates and benzos. Okay. Uh, and I can't tell you how many thousands and thousands of kids I've seen, okay, that had the same damn story. And, and what our previous speaker was saying yesterday about how this is wiping out a generation, it is wiping out a generation. It's not decimation. It's worse than decimation, because decimation means one out of ten. And in Maricopa County, it's more than one out of ten. You know, decimation is when the centurions came to a town and said, you're not, the Roman centurions, you're not bowing down to our gods and you're not paying taxes, okay? So that if people counted off by 10, and then the centurions dismembered those people with their broadswords in front of the rest of the population as a morale booster to help them understand that they needed to bow down to Roman gods and pay taxes, okay? Decimation does not mean being wiped out. It means 10% reduction, okay? So we're seeing worse than that in Maricopa County. The other thing we're seeing is a 92% of the young heroin addicts that present to us, okay? 92% of them, okay? Their gateway their gateway to heroin is prescription pain pills. And they're not getting it from the, pharma, from the grandma's medicine chest so much. When I ask them that, they laugh. They said, man, you've got to be so lucky to get enough dope um, that way that if that your granny gets cancer and then she gets a full you know, ho home hospice you know, load of morphine or something like that and she dies the next day. I mean, that could happen, doc, but that's not the way it usually is. These kids get their stuff, and I'm talking about the ones that become addicts, okay? These kids get their stuff from commercial diversion rings, and they get it in middle school, and they get it in high school. And when the day comes to convert to heroin, it's always the same story. I'll say, well, Sally, why did you decide to go to heroin? Didn't you know that was more dangerous? And she said, Doc, my dealer, he told me, he said, Sally, you're, you're behind on points, bitch. That's I'm, this, the word that people use. Okay? And that ain't going to work. Okay? That is not going to work. You've got to pay me the money you owe me for these pills, and it's a, it's a dollar a milligram. Well, when Sally started out on Oxy-10, that kept her going most of the day. Okay? But her, over the past two years now, she's a junior in high school, her habit went up. Okay? So what happens to Sally? The dealer says, you got to pay me now, or I'm just going to have to have one of my boys throw acid in your face in the parking lot some night. Okay? That's how sweet they are okay, to these kids. And so then the dealer will say, but you know, there is something you can do to act in your own best interest. Okay? And you need to make that decision. You need to make it today, and I'll, 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 I'll front you a little something since you're out, and you can try it. They say, you need to switch to tar heroin. Okay? And you need to switch to it because it's cheaper and because it's got more bang for the buck. And you don't have to shoot it up. You just got to smoke it. That's it. That's all you got to do. Okay? And so guess what? The kid says yes most of the time. And they smoke it. And for about a month, they think they won the lottery. Okay? Because they've got hundreds of dollars in their pocket extra each week. Okay? And they're hiring a kite. And everything is golden until their, 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 their tolerance goes up again. And they realize that they have to spend so much money buying so much heroin that they, they, don't, they, can't, they don't have enough to... Uh, they don't have enough money for that either. And that's when they make the next big decision, and that's that they can no longer afford to lose the drug to pyrolysis in the bowl of that heroin pipe. And that's too much drug loss, and so that's when they decide to start injecting it. And if you don't think that be joint, becoming a heroin addict okay, ruins these kids for the rest of their lives in most cases, you're wrong. Okay? These kids wind up being in the criminal underworld, 
prostitution, all those kinds of things. Just, I mean, it's kind of like just watching one of the old training films that I used to see in, in the 1960s in gym class, okay, about all the bad stuff that happens after you smoke a reefer, except this stuff is true. This stuff is going on. The other thing is, is that these are predominantly young Caucasian human beings, okay? And lots of them come from good, 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 wealthy families and upper middle class families. And it is, it is it's a big problem. Okay, uh, we've got to rush through some of this stuff here now. Okay, after Big Pharma won the war, as far as the legalization of opioids on demand in the United States of America, and it is, it is legal on demand. Okay, you do need to have either health insurance or some rectangular green pictures of dead presidents, or Ben Franklin, and you also, or you can have a credit card that's got credit on it. But if a human being in this culture that we're in right now wants to get Schedule II narcotics, all they need is some way to pay for it, and then willi willingness to see two or three different docs until they find the doc that'll prescribe it. That's the reality. The, 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 old, the old deal where there were big pain mills, uh, pill mills, and that, those were the centers where all the, 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 uh, the drugs were being dispensed from, has changed. There's still pill mills and there's still problems and we still need the DEA and others to go after them. But there's been a sea change in our society, okay, as far as prescribing these drugs. Five minutes, great. Uh, and I can, t I can tell you one thing, how, how much things have changed. We see a lot of kids coming out of the Army in our indigent clinic and they're strung out on, on benzos and stimulant drugs and opiates, and they were given them through their multiple deployments to keep them going, okay, and, and, and to keep them deploying and keep them being bullet launchers and bullet stoppers. Uh, that, that would have never happened like four decades ago or whatever. When I was a battalion surgeon, if I put a kid, if I put a combat infantryman on 10 milligrams of Alavil, amitriptyline, okay, we had to get a big red stamp, stamp it on his, on his paperwork, said not combat deployable, may not handle loaded weapons, okay? That's how, that's how tough it was, okay? And, and, uh, and when you did that, boy, the chain of command, they didn't like that because they were down, they were down one little snuffy. The problem is, is that things have changed so much in our society that, that the prescribing of these drugs is, is, is quite rampant. The last thing I'm gonna say is this, because we just don't have time to cover all this stuff, is that all of the great guidelines that are put out now by Big Pharma are good, okay? They're on the package inserts. All the guidelines by the major pain societies are good guidelines. But in my opinion, they ain't gonna work, okay? And the reason I believe they're not gonna work is because they're voluntary, okay? It's, 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 it's insanity, but it's, it's voluntary, and nobody has to do these guidelines. Nobody has to follow these guidelines, okay? So how do other countries do it? They, do, they, they make some of these things mandatory. In British Columbia, they made it mandatory that when you write for a controlled substance, you gotta check their equivalent of the, of the prescription monitoring program, of the cures program, okay? And you have to put the query number right there below your narcotic number. They don't call it a DEA number. And, and that, putting that query number is your affidavit is saying, I checked and this, this person is not getting multiple prescribers for controlled substances in the previous 90 day period, okay? That has cut down drug diversion, okay, and drug abuse to a certain degree in British Columbia tremendously, okay? But it only happens because we make a law against it. And believe me, laws, if we, what if we repealed drunk driving and we repealed the law against driving by a, a school bus when the lights are flashing and we repealed the speed limit law, okay? Do you think we might see an epidemic of, uh, of uh, excess motor vehicle mortality, especially in school zones of children? Of course you would. You'd see a huge amount of that, okay? Uh, and uh, actually, motor vehicle might even go above uh, 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 prescription drugs again someday if we repealed all those laws. So the thing is, is I have, I'm very, very, very um, skeptical that voluntary guidelines, no matter how good they are, are going to have massive impact on this problem. In closing, uh, I need to cover one thing for Dr. Sutcher. Oh, okay, two things, real quick. Number one, opioid addiction is treatable, okay? And people can maintain abstinence with opioid addiction. But no one, virtually no one in this country gets quality opioid treatment and quality aftercare, okay? Where people are followed carefully, they're held accountable, they have drug testing, and there's consequences whether or not they, they, they do well. The other thing is, is this, is that if you look at their, what, what happens to us with physicians and, and, and pharmacists and PAs and nurses in Arizona, once we started using naltrexone along with traditional treatments and making sure that we were checking that urine for not only naltrexone but naltrexone metabolites, okay, we 
had our recovery rate for our anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists and pharmacists and all that go from 10 to 15 percent to close to 90 percent. Okay, so if somebody gives a damn, okay, you can get good results treating opioid dependency. Thing is, is that sick addicts are good for business. Okay, and and uh, there's just there's just there's just no will within our society to do it. Last thing I'll say is this, and this is really the last thing. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what our reaction as a nation would be if Al Qaeda slipped in, say, 10,000 terrorists into our country, okay, and they were poisoning Americans randomly as acts of terror, okay? What do you think? What do you think it would be? You think we'd just be waiting three years for the results to come in, like we do for our stats on, on the people that die of drug overdose? Do you think we'd be doing nothing or just talking about it? No. If this was the case, if Al Qaeda was killing this many people, we would. Uh, you drive here today, you would have come to a big intersection, and there would have been some National Guard guys with M16s cocked and locked, pointed at your belly button, okay, saying, "Sir, get out of the car, open your trunk. We're checking for poisoners. We're checking for poisoners." Okay. And, uh, and that would be the reaction to that. But really and truly, all this death and destruction and all that is just the, it's just the, um, it's, it's just the collateral damage to successful business operations. It's what it is. That's all it is. So on that disappointing note, um, I will say one last thing. There are some solutions that are coming down in future. It will probably be a couple years before these solutions come through. They're being patented and, and they have to be they have to be held back, but uh, there may be some hope. Uh, and I certainly hope there is, and now I'll pass to Darlene. Thank you. So I'll just let you know as they're changing the slides out that um, this program was supposed to be about education, but I think I agree with you. We need to talk about the stories so that we can make an impact on what you're doing. I'm going to tell you some more stories, but I'm also going to let you know what UCSD is doing. Go down to this one. Um, and I'm proud of some of the you know steps that we've taken, but we're in the baby toddler stage. You know, like you just said, we we've got 10 years of data now. And we're just starting to talk about this. And I'm glad the board, the medical board and the pharmacy board, have put programs like this together. Um, I'll tell you, I learn the most from going to the Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force, hanging with the cops, the DEA, the FBI, because they can tell you stories that, as a professional, you don't even think exist. And so I'd like to try to put it in perspective about, and, and Judy kind of started that. She had a, a wealth of information. I would really suggest, as pharmacists, you get her slides and you review her slides and learn her slides. And probably we need to have more programs specific to that. But what I found is they know more than us about drug abuse, about what the pharmacies are doing, what the physicians are doing. And um, it's, it's really worth your time to find out more information. So this is a picture. Joe, I can't pronounce anybody's last name. Mine's Fujimoto, and that's supposed to be hard, but all the names of the speakers, so I'm going to kind of use first names. Sorry about that. But um, Joe, who gave a wonderful presentation, covered a lot of great information in a very entertaining and informed way, um, mentioned this case, mentioned Sanford, Florida. It's already been a year since this happened. And this is uh, the DEA carrying out evidence from uh, a couple of the pharmacies that were closed down in Florida. My focus, of course, is more of the pharmacies. You've heard a lot of information about abuse. But what I'm saying is it's, it's going up, not with just opioids. I don't call them narcotics, because I actually come from a pain advocate background and treating cancer pain from 20, 25 years ago. And, as well as geriatric pain in long-term care where it wasn't being treated before. Now it sounds like they're getting the end stage of abuse. Um, but it's going up, um, hypnotics, narcotics, et cetera. And, and that's what this program is about. And we, you know, I'm not going to beat this uh, dead horse. You should be convinced by now that we need to do something. Um, this comes from Scott Fishman, who was actually supposed to be at this program. And so in, in, in you know, kind of giving him some credit, he actually has a little handbook that probably was supported by some of the people that you've talked about. But uh, responsible opioid um, prescribing, but it also gives a lot of how 
uh, pharmacists and pharmacies should, should look at things. And pharmacies need to start looking, pharmacists need to start looking at patients, patient-centered, patient-focused care, and they need to start looking at what they can do clinically and how to evaluate the patients, not as Judy said, they don't just fill prescriptions that a physician writes. So, you know, there's a lot of lack of, of knowledge, of standards, um, myths about addiction dependence that have been, you know, propagated by whoever. Um, the perception of regulatory scrutiny, I hope you understand and have heard today that the regulatory agencies really are trying not to step in uh, to medical and cl clinical practice, and in some ways, we may need more of that than less of it, but at least, what I'd like to do is promote more education to make sure that we set guidelines for you to use. Again, guidelines are only guidelines, but to give you those resources, or you can now look up the resources, um, as David said, that you know, are available from everywhere, and they're really good guidelines. We can discuss more about how to implement those guidelines, but you need to understand the regulatory policies and processes also. And again, this is from Scott Fishman. Um, I know that pharmacists are really, they're really well trained in the regulatory piece of it. But again, they need to step aside and, and incorporate more of the patient care aspects. I know that physicians generally are less well trained in the regulatory pieces and parts of controlled substance use, record keeping, et cetera, and that's where maybe they can learn something today. Again, just as a reminder, we do have the Controlled Substances Act. These are narcotics. I don't like to um, refer to pain medications, anxiety medications to patients as narcotics because it gets a really negative connotation. So I really like to kind of specify we're going to give you something for your anxiety, something for your depression. Um, but just as a reminder, this is abuse potential. It really doesn't have a relationship to how good of a treatment they are, how they should be used. That's all I'm going to say about that. Oh, maybe I'll say one more thing. You can see that I have highlighted here SOMA. Um, it took, I don't know, 10, 15 years to get it reclassified to a C4. It was just reclassified last year. We've known about that abuse, again, for 10 years and the combinations that it's, it's used, used with. So, uh, you know, it, it's a moving, living document, as Joe said, but it moves very slowly. Um, again, this talks about just, um, this came from the FDA briefing when they were talking about hydrocodone. Again, we've known that hydrocodone is the most prescribed and possibly the most abused um, prescription drug everywhere, and we're still looking at it now, should we reclassify it? So I think this is a call to action. This meeting is a call to action. I'm glad there's so many people here that, um, you know, you've gotten the data on prescription drug abuse. But pharmacists can't repeatedly ignore red flags. Sometimes they're pink flags. Sometimes they're not as easy to determine whether or not somebody is abusing. But you know, you get that gut feeling, or you kind of know that I'm being rushed, and I can pick out these patients. I have an Eagle Eye pharmacist that works at UCSD who is constantly bringing me case, cases and patients, and I want to share some of those with you. But just to be aware that there's more criminal and administrative actions occurring because of this epidemic, because it's so prevalent, that you've got to get up to speed on what you need to do to protect your license, to protect, protect your patients. Um, a lot of the regulatory changes I want to point out don't come from the regulatory agencies. They come from moms. Um, Ryan Heights' mom is the one that was responsible, I think, a lot. She gathered the people together and basically forced this internet pharmacy issue. Um, Mothers Against Drug Drivers, that was moms too. So, you know, moms have a good purpose, and a lot of our cases that we're looking at now, we've had young people dying. You know, like you just said, Dr. Greenberg talked about, it's a generation that we're looking at now of loss. So, in light of red flags, the pharmacist needs to educate, um, add a, additional diligence. They need to look at cures. They need to use it. And I know it's a change in priorities. It could be a change in workflow. You know, we did that at UCSD somewhat, but we're still not there. This is data that we got from the San Diego coroner um, last year. And you can see they all are controlled substances, except for diphenhydramine. It was interesting that he found that some of the deaths related to diphenhydramine, they're going up. And that was uh, substantial. 
in relation to controlled substance. So it's not just controlled substances, but we've already hit on the controlled substances that, are, that are, are causing people to die. And this is really when somebody is not committing suicide and they have found these products as the primary cause of death in San Diego. And again, this information is shared at the COP meeting, as I call it. Um, oxycodone, be aware that the 30 milligrams has replaced Oxycontin 80 milligrams for abuse because it's easier to, you know, the formulation, after the formulation change, um, a lot of the diverters have now gone to replacing it with the 30 milligrams. And that there is a, been a decrease, and I think I stole these from Kevin, and Kevin's going to talk later, but um, that there is a, a decrease in the um, street price, which is, you know, representative of how valuable it is on the street of the Oxycontin 80s now that the Oxycontin, they're going after the Oxycontin 30. So again, just be aware, this is another pink to red flag. Um, several people have already mentioned corresponding responsibility, um, but it does rest with the pharmacist. And I've actually taken pages. You know, I've, I've had the pharmacist call the doctor, and the doctor says, just fill it. And the doctor says, don't bother me, and I've, I've seen this patient and just fill these prescriptions prescriptions. But I actually took a page from the, med from the pharmacy board newsletter and faxed it to one of the doctors I was talking to because she was being a little obstinate. Although, you know, when the pharmacist, the regulatory compliance pharmacist calls as opposed to the outpatient pharmacist who they've heard from before, they actually did call back. And so I talked to her. I faxed her the information from the board of pharmacy and I said, listen, we're not trying to just bug you but we're trying to take care of our patients, but we have a, responsi a legal responsibility also. She ended up meeting with me. We talked about her one patient, and this was a sickle cell patient. And being a pain management advocate, I didn't want to pull his drugs, but the pharmacist had the feeling that he was selling the drugs. And she says, he looks better, he's dressing really nice, he used to come in, he looked like a bum. And again, we're not in the best area at the Hillcrest location. And I said, well, you know, but sickle cell patients, maybe he's feeling better, going through all of the pain assessment that we go through. So I said, let's look at this. Let's take a look at the cures. Let's, but he was in a special program. So he got his medications funded by a special program for sickle cell patients. He was only getting his prescriptions from us, but it was a boatload. He was getting the 600 microgram uh, transmucosal uh, lollipops, as they don't like to be called. He was getting about six a day, PRN. In addition to that, he was getting thousands of milligrams of OxyContin. And that was all paid for by an outside group. But I was still trying to support the pain patient. And I said, let's look at this. We got a call from a neighbor. The guy's selling this stuff. And it just happened that it kind of came in around the same time. Pulled this case back out, called the doctor again. And I said, do you have a pain contract? She says, yes. So we got the pain contract out, you know, one physician, one pharmacist. And so then I pulled the cures report for her. And we looked at the cures report. Well, he had gone minor things, but had gone to a dentist, had gone to another uh, physician, and gotten some oxycodone, I mean, um, hydrocodone, Vicodin, which is very easy to do, the 30 from the dentist, et cetera. But I said, does this not violate your agreement that you have? And she says, yes. And then what happened was she started thinking, maybe this is a problem. And she actually, she's an internal medicine physician. She says, I don't know what to do. So I said, you need, and, and physicians haven't been trained on what to do, how to evaluate their patients, how to talk to their patients about their concerns, as much as they have been taught to diagnosis and prescribe and treat. So I said, well, I'd have him on a really short leash. And I, she says, well, he won't come in. And I said, well, then you don't have to prescribe for him if he won't come in. So she says, OK. And I said, I would actually recommend that you, he comes in and you do a urine tox screen on him. And you tell him that that's the only way you're going to prescribe for him. So she did. She called him in. He came in because he didn't have any prescriptions and uh, ran a urine tox screen. And I said, you're going to have two options. You're going to find a lot of drug in his system, which will be good, because that means he's taking it. Although I questioned the last sickle cell um, crisis was about three years ago. So I was kind of considering, mm, does he really need all this to the day? And then he was going with little early refill requests. So she did a tox screen, and he had no opioids in his system. And so that really helped her to make the decision and decide what to do with this patient. And basically, he's not her patient any longer. 
Um, and then we did report him to the authorities too because we felt that he pro this, these were enough indications or red flags that he probably was selling, you know, talk to the neighbor, talk to the neighbor's mother, et cetera. So um, this is the corresponding responsibility law again, but not in the usual course of professional treatment. So you can see how we went from the usual course of professional treatment to this person is probably not doing something correct. Now, um, the pharmacist then knowingly filling such a purported prescription is also illegal. So they have a responsibility to evaluate. Pharmacists are, tend to be fairly sensitive to this. And so you need to make sure that you go with your gut reactions. You talk to the, your managers. Um, I know in chains they're really busy, and I have heard the same things about the managers saying just fill these prescriptions. Um, not necessarily just the chains, but you know, busy pharmacies, that the pharmacists are under pressure to fill prescriptions and they aren't given the time. When I talk about cures, I'm going to talk about some of the things that I think we need to do to improve that. But these are not legal prescriptions if they're not in the usual course of professional treatment and it's um, for an addict or habitual user. So you know, remember those. And this is a case that um, I wanted to go over here too. This is similar to some of the cases that have been discussed already. This is a physician from Los Angeles. And actually, I got most of this case from the COP meetings, the Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force. I knew about this physician from LA two years ago when I started going to those meetings. Um, but the patient lives in southeast San Diego, which is not the best area in San Diego. But that's already a red flag. You know, 100 miles to go to the doctor and come back here. Turns out that from what the cops told me, um, they were actually getting van loads of people, um, homeless people, indigent people, and they were driving them up to this doctor in Los Angeles. The doctor would then see the patients, write the prescriptions, then they'd bring them back down to San Diego and fill those prescriptions. Well, when we went back and looked at some of the history of these, there were several pharmacies who turned these down, you know, because it was out of my area, I don't know this doctor, you know, you're scary to me, but they had turned these prescriptions down. What happens is they did find pharmacies who were filling these prescriptions, and then they would sell them or give them back to the person who was putting this little van trip together. They'd give them lunch, they'd give them some cash, but they would get all the prescriptions. Now, if you saw prescriptions coming in from a patient, three oxy, for, uh, three, all three of these are written on the same prescription. Oxycontin, 80 milligrams three times a day. Xanax, two milligrams three times a day. And Soma, 350, two, three times a day. After this meeting, if you get nothing else, but this is not a great combination, I'll be happy. Um, you don't know this person. Do you feel as a pharmacist you should be filling 80 milligrams three times a day for somebody you don't know, don't have a history? Pull a cures, but then again, if they're using false names, you got a problem. If you're not checking IDs, you got a problem. Xanax, two milligrams. I talked to our psychiatry department because I said, you know, we don't see very many prescriptions from you for Xanax. They go, we don't write it because it's too abused. You know, that's pretty much it's going to the street. So, you know, be aware the professionals know this too, but these the the uh, abusers are putting this combination together because that's where they get the heroin rush or whatever I'm told they get. And then the Soma 350 milligrams TID. We have a pain task force and a pain consortium. So we were just talking about this last week. Um, the, do the pain docs don't write for Soma. And they actually very seldom write for muscle relaxants at all because they say basically they just sedate people and the mechanism. Although they did just talk about using uh, flexoril or cyclobenzaprine instead of Soma. So now we can take the information back from this meeting and say, you know, what are we going to do about that or how should we evaluate that? But anyway, this is like just a problem waiting to happen. I have pain specialists there in parentheses or quotes because like you were saying, anybody can say they're a pain specialist. Well, when the pharmacist comes in and says, well, the guy's a pain specialist, I talked to him. He was a member of the American Pain Society. He was a member of all these different things. He actually had given them some of his certificates. I said, these are certificates of membership. They say nothing about a pain specialty. So again, you have to put the pieces together. It does take time. 
But if you have something like this, it's well worth your time to investigate that. So I took some of the red flags that the DEA has, that Scott Fishman has, that a lot of people have, kind of put it into what we were looking at from the pharmacy's perspective. Physician location based uh, with the patients, where they're located, where do they live, where do they work. Is there a reason why they would pass up 30 pharmacies before they would come to your pharmacy to get this filled? What is that reason? Um, the practitioner is prescribing these inordinate large quantities or high doses that you're not, you know, you don't know this patient. Um, they're using different pharmacies. I think with the Cures talk, I have an example of that. Young patients, young males, young Caucasian males, you know, it's not that saying that they can't have chronic pain, but when they come in, or when four of them come in in a row, um, that should be a little indication. With the same prescriptions from the same doctor, that should be an indication to you. Um, I think we covered most of these things. Oh, paying cash. A lot of physicians are, are removed from the costs of drugs. Do you know how much Oxycontin, 80 milligrams, three times, uh, 240 tablets costs? How much? 1,000, 1,500. 2,000, and these, these yo relatively young males are coming and paying cash for that. You know, how many times do you not have a, have a patient who complains about their copay as a pharmacist? You know, $25, I mean, I even do that. Like $25? These people are bringing out, you know, boatloads of money or using Visa cards or something like that, but usually it's cash. So again, it's not something that you would easily miss. And that's what the board is looking at and going at. If you have a patient like the sickle cell patient, I think they would have given us some leeway because we were documented, we were following it up. Um, we did give them the benefit of the doubt, but then we followed it up and found, no, this isn't a legitimate patient. And even though we had some red flags, we followed it up, we documented what we were doing. And that's the big thing, is documenting what you're doing. This is something that I like to tell the physicians, especially that the pharmacist does have the legal right to refuse to dispense a controlled substance when they believe it's not issued in good faith. And they have the right and duty to ascertain from the physician or try to ascertain from the prescriber the purpose for issuing the prescription if they doubt that it's legitimate. So, you know, help the pharmacists out. We don't want to spend a half an hour just to bug you. We really are trying to protect our licenses. We're trying to protect our patients and also minimize the abuse and addiction and diversion. Um, I put in this just so that you would have it in your handout. Again, this is a guideline from the medical board. I thought it'd be appropriate to go over the medical board guideline. It's very easy. There's bullet points. Um, if you hit these things, and again, this is your documentation that you need to have. History, treatment plan, informed consent. Scott, Scott Fishman goes into a lot more detail about that. I bulleted some of the changes because they did update it in 2007. Um, and patients on controlled substances should be screened, sheet seen regularly as required by the standard of care. If you don't know what the standard of care is, again, Scott Fishman has a little um, table in his um, um, booklet that says, you know, if the patient is, if you highly consider that this patient could be abusing, you probably need to see them weekly. When you've changed their doses, see them weekly. Then you can move to biweekly. Then you can move to monthly. So it's not a static thing, but you need to be following some type of typical, you don't have, a, we had a doctor that he would have the patients come in twice a month, charge them $200 for each visit, and write them these prescriptions. So, you know, it's not that easy, but that, you know, the physician was getting his, you know, payments and things like that. But there are kind of standards. One of the things I wanted to bring up was um, the coordination of care and prescribing chronic opioids. Um, you need to do cons consultation sometimes. We're actually revising our, our chronic pain guidelines. Um, Greg is going to talk, and um, the pain consortium is actually re revising that. Dr. Wallace and Dr. Ahadian, both anesthesiology pain specialists, and they're actually decreasing the morphine level. They're, they're decreasing it. And if you look at a lot of the literature now, 
120 milligrams of morphine or equivalents is what they're saying is you probably need to be looking at a pain um, evaluation, calling in pain consults, et cetera. That's a fairly low dose. Um, but again, chronic opioids have not been proven to be effective, especially at the high doses. So we've learned a lot in the, in the last 10 years. Um, the last things I wanted to point out is their um, supervision of PAs and NPs. Uh, as, as my regulatory compliance job at the hospital, I've gone through and looked at scope of practice. And thanks to the California Department of Public Health, um, they've helped us move forward in a lot of things. We've gotten cited, it hasn't been fun, we've had surveys, many surveys, but some of the things they've brought up to us are the pharmacist, pharmacy is responsible for medication use in their licensed facilities. We have to step up, we have to do more, and that's what we have been doing. Um, I found that some of the PAs, physicians have PAs. I found that there were PAs working in the hospital. Who's their supervisor? I don't know. So I don't know what the medical board is doing about that, but this is in the medical board guidelines that the physicians who are, or the prescribers who are overseeing the practice of PAs and MPs, they're not completely independent. They can independently prescribe, but their practices are not necessarily completely independent. So you need to understand your supervision um, requirements what the medical board has set up. And, and I would really recommend you look at that because uh, training for pain management, you know, NPs, PAs can get DEA numbers that allows them to prescribe any level of, of uh, narcotic, as we call them. But what is their education? How much do they know? And remember that, especially PAs, they're working under a physician's license. So I would just like to caution you on that. Um, some of the education and accountability for opioids and controlled substances. I'm going to talk about some of this more specifically when we talk about cures, but I agree with the emergency room doctor, and I have a case that I'll present there um, where we had to, again, step up and cause a big brouhaha at UCSD, but it's actually turned out to be very beneficial, and it pulled the whole organization together to address some of this drug abuse and dual diagnosis issues. And then, of course, we're going to talk about cures later, so. I think I got us on time. In, in order to keep our forum running on time, we're going to ask Dr. Fujimoto and Greenberg to please wait until the break, which will be in 15 minutes, and you can take some questions there. And then I know you're both on the panel behind that, so you'll have some opportunities for questions then. Um, we have a lot of speakers that have a lot to say, and it's important you hear it, so we're losing the ability to do questions during part of this. Our next speaker is um, Kevin Bernard, who's the region compliance, Regional Compliance Manager for H.D. Smith. Those of you that may not know, H.D. Smith is the fourth largest wholesaler in the U.S. Mr. Bernard served 27 years. Whoops. Sorry, I want your notes. Um, could I have his Could I have his PowerPoint preloaded, please, so that we can move right into this? Um, he specializes. Um, excuse me, Mr. Here we go. Mr. Bernard served 27 years with the San Diego Police Department, and 20 of those years were as a detective. He has an extensive background doing undercover investigations of drugs. So he's, hence why H.D. Smith would find him so attractive as an employee. He specializes in the investigation of diversion of pharmaceutical medications to illicit use. In his current position as a compliance manager at H.D. Smith, he investigates compliance issues with customers. And welcome, Mr. Bernard. He's updated his slides, so it's going to take him a quick second here to preload. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, this quick little presentation is about the uh, transition of uh, oxycotton to oxycodone 30 milligram that I've uh, kind of witnessed over the past uh, number of years. And um, 
and I first, <clears throat> well, like uh, Jenny said, I worked for San Diego PD, and I worked uh, um, in narcotics, and I, uh, my background is working uh, just strictly pharmaceuticals when I worked narcotics, and I was a member of the uh, San Diego Rexnet Pharmaceutical Narcotics Enforcement Team for a number of years, so I got pretty used to uh, dealing with uh, individual addicts uh, that were addicted to uh, pharmaceuticals. And, uh, you know, OxyContin was the big, was the big star uh, back in those days. And, um, and I retired in, in 2007, and, and I went to work for a, uh, a contractor uh, uh, that did uh, Medicare Part D fraud investigations. And, um, and uh, I, I made some observations back then that were pretty shocking, and uh, I've ca kind of carried forward that, uh, and I, I kind of developed it into an evaluation tool, and I'm going to go through that with you here. So some basic numbers are that, uh, you know, we have this huge increase in uh, the quotas for uh, OxyContin and related opioid uh, drugs over the past 10 years. <clears throat> uh, 1997 production quota of OxyContin, 8.3 tons. 2011 production quota of OxyContin, 105 tons. Um, pretty crazy numbers. So this is getting, uh, and like I said, I'm going to go through this very quickly. If you have questions, uh, we can maybe get a few at the end, and I'll be around uh, after, uh, during the break. But what I, here's what I observed. <clears throat> I was doing uh, referrals for this uh, Part D investigation, and there were a number of uh, prescribers in the Los Angeles area that had a very monotonous prescribing pattern, and that was for Oxy, Cotton 80, 80 milligram quantity 90, and that was essentially the number that Part D would uh, let slip through the system without a pre-authorization. So it was every patient getting that quantity, maybe something, uh, maybe a, a, a medication mixed in here and there, but pretty much it was about 90% oh, that was what these uh, prescribers were doing. So I'm working up a, uh, um, uh, a referral to Office of Inspector General, Health and Human Services, and as I'm looking at the data, about September, October of 2010, suddenly the OxyContin completely disappeared off the radar. And suddenly, what I was seeing 100% across the board was oxycodone 30 milligram IR uh, quantity 240. And if you did the math, we're looking at 7,200 milligrams of um, oxycodone. That was an equivalent amount to the Oxy-80s. And um, so, uh, you know, I began to research that a little bit, and I, I couldn't understand it at first why this sudden shift. And then it kind of dawned on me that possibly there was something to do with this uh, rumored reformulation of OxyContin. So I actually contacted Purdue Pharma through uh, National Association of Drug Diversion Investigators and found out that, lo and behold, August 10, 2010 was the magical date that Oxy-80s were reformulated and the new formulation was released. And apparently it's been a, quote, big success, maybe not from the sales perspective of Purdue Pharma, but um, there was a big drop in their sales and um, it's continued to go downhill. Now they say uh, OxyContin declined 49 uh, the, the diversion declined 49% among individuals being assessed for substance abuse problems the first 11 months. I think it's much more dramatic today than it is just at 49%. <clears throat> so then there's these kind of anecdotal uh, side effects and various things that I've heard, um, you know, when I discuss this issue. Um, it, it, it causes headaches, it causes nausea. This is the new OxyContin. Um, it releases differently. You know, every one of these things, um, you know, I, I, to my satisfaction, I've been able to uh, explain or refute. Uh, it does, it does, let's see, it does release slightly different than the old formula, but not significantly. Um, I've confirmed that with Purdue and some of the studies FDA has done. So we're not dealing with an entirely different drug here. It just, uh, it's just really hard to divert. Um, and, the, and the big thing that, one of the big things that I noticed was that the street values began to plummet for OxyContin. And this is, I think you just saw this slide a minute ago. Uh, these are very, very conservative um, numbers, but uh, today OxyContin on the street is not hardly worth anything. I mean, literally, almost zero. I mean, you, you can't even sell it almost on the streets in, in a lot of jurisdictions. So, uh, and then oxycodone 30 milligram has held its value. If you're an investor, that's what you want to see, right? <clears throat> uh, 
being in the private uh, sector nowadays, I, I, I do con I'm concerned about these investment issues. <clears throat> So then I thought, well, you know, let's look at a bigger picture here. Um, uh, let's look at Medi-Cal. Let's see if they'll, uh, what their numbers look like. And, and when I, you know, uh, you know, sometimes people get a little defensive about this stuff. Um, let me tell you something. Everybody's numbers look like this. H.D. Smith's numbers look like this. Your pharmacy numbers may look like this. Um, you know, it, it's system-wide. So it, it's just a phenomenon that I think um, what I've discovered is it's a, it's a tool that I can start to evaluate some prescribing patterns and things like that. So, I, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't feel a need to defend it in a, in a system-wide kind of basis. It just, it occurred. It's a moment in history, and I think it's an evaluation tool. So, um, what I was told by Lee Worth, I think, Lee, you're here somewhere today, uh, from Medi-Cal, um, that um, they had, prior to 2000, August 2010, they had numerous, you know, lots of Medi-Cal beneficiaries say, look, I, OxyContin, is the only thing I can take. I can't take Cadian. I can't take you know these other you know long-acting opioids. They just uh, they don't they don't work. They make me sick. My hair hurts. You know my day goes wrong. So after about September 2010, suddenly these same beneficiaries, these same patients that had all these limitations, they were now uh, saying the same thing about OxyContin, and uh, now they must have they must have Oxy Oxycodone 30 milligram IR, and 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 oftentimes these patients were the one would have, uh, they named the oxycodone 30 milligram as one of the medications they couldn't take prior to, prior to August 2010. So here's just some kind of dosage units and, uh, and cost reimbursements, oxycodone 30 milligram. You can see it's going up pretty dramatically. Uh, I think a better look is this. Um, this is the dosage units. Uh, so oxy, oxycontin is up there at the top you see from 2006 to 2008 9 um, it's it's on the rise I think there was some action to kind of get some control of it in 2008 2009 and then uh, late 2010 it just falls off completely and then uh, correspondingly the oxycodone 30 milligram is, is coming up pretty dramatically as well and this uh, dollar spent by Medi-Cal again a pretty dramatic fall off late 2010 Oxycodone 30 milligrams fairly inexpensive medication, so I don't think that the money is really showing there. So then um, I went to work for H.D. Smith, and part of what I do, well, primarily what I do is evaluate uh, pharmacies and legitimate prescribing and uh, risk factors to the wholesaler because DEA has basically said that, uh, you know, we have a corresponding responsibility as well, and we better know our customer and we better know what they're doing with our product. So we do evaluate on a pharmacy by pharmacy basis what's going on. And I was asked to evaluate some pain management specialty pharmacies um, because H.D. Smith doesn't typically take those on as a customer. We look at them very, very closely before we do. So um, I said, well, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at some pre-August 2010 numbers and, and compare them to what they're doing today. And this is what I basically saw was this kind of 60-40 uh, well, in this particular case, it was a 40% OxyContin, and I'm, and I'm doing this, by the way, by milligram. I'm, I'm trying to compare apples to apples, so I'm not doing a dosage unit because that wouldn't quite line up. So I did milligram by milligram, and what I saw was uh, in this particular pharmacy, they were at 40% uh, OxyContin 80 milligram in July 2010, 60% uh, OxyCodone 30 milligram. And then by uh, a, little, a little over a year later, they were at 86% oxycodone 30 milligram and uh, down to 14% oxycontin 80 milligram. Here's one that was 50-50 uh, in July 2010. And about a year later, um, they were at 76% oxycodone 30 milligram and 24% oxycontin 80 milligram. Here's another one that uh, actually held the line. And actually, when I visited this pharmacy and, and talked to the pharmacist in charge, when I walked out of there before I looked at the numbers, I, I felt like this guy really knew what he was doing. He seemed to have a handle on things, and I think the numbers pretty, pretty much bear it out. He seems to have held the line here on that. And, um, you know, so it can be done. Um, this, one, uh, this one was pretty dramatic. 73% uh, oxycontin 80 milligram, July 2010. Oxycodone 30 milligram was at 27% at the same time. And then uh, a little over a year later, they were at 91% oxycodone 30 milligram, 9% oxycontin 80 milligram. And this was their, their top, this was the top prescriber from that pharmacy. Um, just looking at his uh, month by month uh, prescribing, and you can see the oxycodone 30 milligram rising very dramatically. 
Eventually, he was arrested uh, by Cal DOJ for slinging these prescriptions out of a local Starbucks. <clears throat> Here's an interesting number. Um, this is FDA, Oxy Watchdog, October 2012. They did a, a survey of 2,566 people seeking treatment for opioid dependence. 24% of the respondents found a way to defeat the tamper-resistant Oxy OxyContin, and 66% reported switching to another opioid. That was a pretty consistent number of what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing about a 60-40 you know, flip, it seems like, on average uh, when I look at these things. Um, so, you know, what, is this, what does this tell us? Is it, is it prima facie evidence of diversion or illeg uh, illegitimate prescribing? Mm, maybe, maybe not. Um, I think you have to ask a lot more questions. Um, is an indicator of more investigation needed? Yes. Uh, I think when you see something like this, I think you need to dig a little deeper and evaluate what's going on. And from your perspective uh, as a pharmacist or a prescriber, you're, you know, if you're doing pain management, for instance, um, you might have a patient base that suddenly, you know, again, their hair hurts if they take OxyContin 80. Well, my question would be is why have we had a wholesale um, – if OxyContin is truly a different medication and it's causing some side effects, then why are we moving from an extended release therapy to an immediate release therapy? That doesn't make any sense to me. It just didn't make any sense. I've never heard a, a, an argument that really holds water as to why this occurred, other than what I think happened is that there's a large, well, first off, I think OxyContin, the old formula, was an immediate release medication. It may have been marketed as an extended release, but essentially uh, it operated as an immediate release medication because it was easily defeated. And I think that it indicates that a large number of people who are on that, on that drug are using it for other reasons than pain, pain control and pain management. And I think this is a point in history that, that actually points to that uh, as a fact. Um, so that's, that's my evaluation of what's happened here. I think it's a great tool to evaluate uh, your, your pharmacy and what's happened. I think you don't pay attention to those things on a month-by-month -month basis. Um, and if you need help looking at that, I can probably look at your dispensary report and give you some sort of feedback as to what's going on. So that's what I have. Thank you very much. Whoops. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. We're now going to take a 15-minute break. Those of you that have not signed in for your CE this morning, please make sure you do outside on the tables. We'll see you in 15 minutes. Please return on time. Thank you.